my Toronto VK on the beat uh-huh. Check. Uh-huh. I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love oh. I'm from Toronto where you wanna get the city love okay. I'm in Toronto like you wanna get the city love That's right. My city love me back Welcome to episode 1142 of Toronto mike proudly brought to you by Great Lakes Brewery. Order online for free local home delivery in the GTA. StickerU.com. Create custom stickers, labels, tattoos, and decals. Palma Pasta. Fresh, homemade Italian pasta and entrees. The Yes, We Are Open podcast, a Moneris podcast production. The Advantaged Investor podcast from Raymond James, Canada. RecycleMyElectronics.ca. Committing to our planet's future means properly recycling our electronics of the past. Ridley Funeral Home, pillars of the community since 1921. And Canna Cabana, the lowest prices on cannabis. Guaranteed. Joining me today, making his third visit to the TMDS studio, is Steve Simmons. Welcome back, Steve. Nice to be here. Happy Halloween. I see you went as uh, Steve Simmons this year. Um, I actually have a, a costume in my car because I'm, I'm going to go over to my son's house later to give out candy because we don't get any kids in our neighborhood anymore. Oh, so you're going to shell out? So I'm gonna, is it Jeff? Yeah. Okay, uh, fellow FOTM, yes. Jeff Simmons. Uh, and, and I'm gonna, we're, we're going, we're bringing the candy and, and doling it out. Amazing. Okay, happy Halloween to you. I, got a, I still have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, so they're all jazzed about going uh, trick-or-treating tonight, but you're, you're way past that at the, this point. It's been a, do you miss it? Do you miss I the s- days? I still love it. I mean, I, I miss the days as a kid. Mm. I remember how impor- important it was for me to go out on Halloween. I, I just and 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 I still feel that way, you know, all these years later. So I I love the holiday. I love you know the way people react to it and treat it. And and as I wrote in the column on Sunday, I, I wish it was a month earlier because we'd get a little bit warmer <laughs> yeah. weather. And in the case of today, a little less damp weather. Yeah, hopefully it dries up for the kids and uh, and for you, Steve. But what is the co- costume that's in your car right now? You said you have a costume in your car. What is it? It's a, um, it's kind of a monster mask. Uh, is the best way to put it. It's one of those masks that's been sitting around the house, and you pull it out once a year. And you, and you gotcha, gotcha. It's not real good. Uh, you know what I have actually though? I played goal when I was a kid, and I played goal in the seventies. And oh, I have that Jason. You see in there? Yeah, I have that Jason mask. Uh, it's still got puck marks. Well, that's what I wear tonight. Puck marks on it. Oh, it's the real deal. Yeah, it, uh, it's it that, that you never thought of that as a Halloween mask when you were playing goal and, right. and getting smashed with pucks. <laughs> but but uh, I've never I can't get, I can't bear to get rid of it. Well, shout out to Jason uh, Voorhees, and uh, I thought maybe because I saw the Diet Coke you brought with you uh, that maybe you were going as Bob Elliott for Halloween. Well, uh, I'd have to uh, uh, <laughs> you know do something like that. Uh, no, uh, Steven. I worked a lot of years besides. Do you know Bob Elliott and I were hired within days of each other? I did not remember that. In 1986, Wayne Parrish took over as the sports editor of the Toronto Sun. He left the Toronto Star to become sports editor. It was a big thing at the time because George Gross had been the, the guy. And Parrish came in and they gave him the ability right away to hire people. And so he made two hirings within, within days of each other. He hired Bob Elliott from the Ottawa Citizen right. and he hired me from the Calgary Herald. And, you know, here we are all these years later, and Bob's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and, <laughs> and I'm still chugging along. You're still writing. Doing what I do. Okay, I have so many questions. Uh, but first, I just want to let the FOTMs listening know. I said it was your third visit. So we have to go all the way back to April 2016. That was your first visit to this uh, studio. And here's what I wrote at the time. I wrote in this 170th episode, Mike chats with Toronto Sun columnist Steve Simmons about his years at the Sun, his relationships with Damian Cox, David Schultz, and James Myrtle. That was a big, quite the trifecta. Uh, His thoughts on analytics and hockey, his Phil Kessel story about hot dogs. You you, uh, infamously addressed that. And uh, I'll tell you now that that clip gets uh, many, many a play still to this day. How he got Howard Berger fired. Uh, not intentional on your part, but it's quite the story. And what it was like being a day oneer at the Fan 590, the Team 1050, 
and the score. That was quite the episode, Steve. Oh, I, I have no recollection of that, but thank you for bringing all that up. <laughs> now it's going to haunt you on this Halloween. Yeah. Now, you came back. Uh, you had such a good time. And you came back to kick out the jams. That was in November 2017. Uh, Mike and Steve discussed... This was episode 288. Mike and Steve discussed several topics, including the recent post-media and tour star swap and cut. Cash Palmer... Maybe we'll get an update today on uh, if you have an update on Cash Palmer. The cancellation of the reporters... Bob Elliott, there he is again, The Athletic, The Argos, TFC, Roy Halliday, Phil Kessel, Joey Bats, his diabetes, his sleep disorder, the death of his brother, and haters on Twitter. And then we played, after all that, we played and discussed your 10 favorite songs of all time. You kicked out the jams. That's a lot of content there. <laughs> Two hours and 17 minutes of I content. Should, I should take that and turn it into a book. <laughs> well, with, okay, shout it out now, and we're going to dive in deeper after we catch up. But what is the name of your new book, Steve? It's A Lucky Life, Gretzky, Crosby, Kawhi, and more from the best seat in the house. Okay, I've actually read it. I enjoyed it, and I, I've got some choice uh, articles that we're going to discuss later. What's your relationship like with uh, a new FOTM who I got along with very well, uh, Liz Braun? Oh, I adore Liz. Um, been a fan of her forever and ever. Um, we worked together forever. Uh, she was a great film reviewer for many, many years. Um, had, had to because everyone's had to sort of switch their lives a little bit and is doing things now that I bet you should give, given the choice, maybe she wouldn't be doing. Um, a terrific lady and uh, really, really smart. I loved my chat with her. It was great to meet her. And uh, I knew I figured you, you worked so many years with Liz, you'd have uh, some words to say about Liz Braun. Speaking of people you worked with, I uh, just recently tweeted out it was the uh, anniversary, one year anniversary of the visit of uh, Mary Ormsby and Paul Hunter to my backyard studio. And of course, you were uh, on the air with Mary Ormsby. It's funny, Mary Armsby and I did one year of radio together. And you would think because of the relationship that we have and that developed, that we probably did 10 years together. Uh, what I think of her, like, I, I just love her. And I think, I think it's the opposite. I think she, you know, gets along with me the same way. And, and Paul is the nicest man on earth. Yes. So you put Mary and Paul together and it's like, Super couple, Sweethearts. sports writers, journalists, whatever, you know, two terrific at, you know, really, really, really good at their jobs. Um, and, and her, you know, on, on my Mount Rushmore of women, you know, she's, she's on it. She's right there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I had a great time chatting with both of them. And like yourself, they contributed to the, uh, to episode 1000 of Toronto Mike. And thank you, Steve, for that submission. You're on uh, episode 1000. So thank you. Well, <laughs> I like to get around. <laughs> All right. So I will tell you. So when a guest is coming on, I always uh, go to Twitter and I'm like, uh, do you have a question or comment for my guest? So the guest before you, Steve, was actually uh, Sharon and Bram. I don't know if your kids. Uh, Skid him a rinky dinky dink. <laughs> there you go. Lois sadly no longer with us. Shout out to Ridley Funeral Home. But uh, Sharon and Bram still with us and they were on the program. And I got so many comments basically like, thank you. I love you. You know, Thank you for giving me permission to dream. The most lovely tweets about what should I say or ask of Sharon and Bram. And then my next guest after Sharon and Bram, uh, Steve Simmons. And I said, okay, what? And I got to say, Steve, so I'm going to look in the eyes with this, but uh, like, I'm, I'm wondering how you, how you deal with the people on Twitter. You're so polarizing. I had people t who wanted me to literally look in the eyes and tell you to F off. Um, there's a real divide between what I call the real world and the online world. And the online world is an angry place. And it's a hateful place. And if you do something that upsets the group, per se, what happens is, is it's mob mentality. And so um, that's one of the reasons I'm really, really pleased and proud of this book is because all of the people who hate me and scream about me and you know, call for my firing and all the things that they do consistently, and and I think I trended for four days last week, which is which I'm, which might be a record. <laughs> um, you know, I would love them all to read this book because it shows a side of me that they don't even know exists. Because if they read me, they wouldn't be nearly as angry 
as they seem to be on a regular basis. And they pick, you know, sort of one, one thing once in a while. And then whether it's, you know, Phil Kessel and, and the hot dog, whether it's Austin Matthews having COVID, which was the dumbest overreaction of all time. Right. Um, you know, to the most recent brouhaha, um, which is rather regrettable. Um, then, you know, but the, as you know, Mike, you've read the book. Um, what it shows is that I'm not about screaming and I'm not about controversy and I'm not about, um, I'm a storyteller. Right. And, and that's what the book is about. Yeah, no, Steve, you, you tell a great story and uh, you're always interesting, which is why I read you. But I uh, also uh, must admit there are moments where you do write something and I think, okay, I, 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 I wonder if Steve wishes he had that back. And then there's one, the, the specific recent uh, brouhaha, as you called it, we got to get into that. But first, that's a little bit lighter off the top here, which is uh, where is the reporter's podcast? Like, like, why aren't you guys podcasting? That is a great question. We did a live show. Um, I at, was there. At, I forget the name. The Paramount? Is that the name of the place? No, the par- Paradise. 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 Paradise Ballroom or something. Yeah. And I thought it was fantastic. And I thought the crowd really liked it. And, and Brendan Shanahan was on. And it, it went great. And we thought that was the beginning of something that was going to. Mm. And there was talk then. There was a couple of companies approached about doing things. And, mm. and, and then the pandemic hit. Yeah, And it was like, and the world blew up and everybody went their own way. And, and so, you know, Bruce Arthur went into basically writing, you know, COVID for a couple of years and, and Dave Hodge, he doesn't call it retirement, but he's not, he's not really broadcasting anymore. And, and Mike Farber is in sort of in semi-retirement in Montreal. He does some work for TSN and, and once in a while for somebody else. And, and I'm still pounding it out. And so we never sort of fig, you know, it, this was always Dave's thing. And by Dave's thing, I mean, Dave was the captain. And so we right. were going to go in whatever direction Dave was going because A, you know, he's terrific at what he does and B, we loved working with him. And so if, you know, if, if, it had, if he had said, we're doing a podcast and starting next week and this is how we're doing it. You'd be there. Yeah, I would be there. I would have signed up. And, and again, I don't know if that, you know, at that time, the belief was there was no money to be made in the podcasting world. And, and we've since found out that there, that that might be the opposite of that. And we probably missed out on the opportunity. Well, I'll say he's in the calendar, Dave Hodge, because every year he comes over and kicks out his 100 favorite songs of the calendar year. So uh, Dave is working on his list. We actually maintain a website, the Hodge100.com or is it Hodge100? Oh, I got to double check, but one of those two. And you can see all of his previous picks, and uh, he'll be back here. We might do it in the backyard. He's being uh, COVID cautious because of his sister, and I appreciate that. So, uh, although I've have you ever had COVID? I have. Okay, so uh, how many bouts have you had with it One. that you know of? One. As far as I know, I've never had COVID, but I just uh, I produce a show for Humble and Fred, and they they've both have it had it now. Uh, Howard got it last week when he was traveling in France, and uh, that makes me last man standing there. But uh, well, my wife's had it twice. Yeah. And she's a she's a, a healthcare worker, uh, and her last case was a bad one. Oh no! Like it was one of those two weeks tough one. Like every day was bad. I'm lucky. I had it for like two days, and I didn't even know I had it, other than I tested positive and sort of just stayed around the house. Got lucky there. Good stuff. Now I will say that you mentioned the live uh, reporters recording with Brendan Shanahan. That feed, so Dave said, hey, can you host this on your podcast feed? So anybody who wants to hear that, it's actually in the Toronto Mike feed the, the, in its entirety. So you can hear Brendan Shanahan and then Dave Hodge, yourself, Michael Farber, uh, who made the trip all the way from uh, Montreal, and Bruce Arthur, of course. So uh, let me know when you want to do a podcast because I just think it would be cool to have a reporter's podcast. I, I, would, I would love that. It's funny, I had an idea about, I don't know, maybe it was five years ago, and at the time, I called it Lunch with the Legends. And what I was going to do is I was going to get a downtown Toronto restaurant and I was going to have like a, some kind of studio set up in the lobby or in, in, somewhere in the restaurant sure. and bring in, and I made a list of about 40 possible guests for this Lunch with the Legends show. And this is before we you know, had any, you know, anything beyond an idea. And I, I pitched it to, at the time, Bev Wake, who was the corporate sports editor for Post Media. Right. And she loved the idea. 
And I think about five days later, she got fired. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> and then I pitched it to someone else there, and they sort of loved the idea and did absolutely nothing with it. And and after sort of, you know, I just, I, you know, when you're, when you're writing a column, the next column is sort of what's always on your brain. So you don't have time always when, when you're thinking about the next column to be thinking about what else, how else am I going to do all these other things. Right. And so... Um, um, and so I never really pursued it. I'm sorry now that I didn't because I think now the, the market is flooded and there's too much out there. Um, but I th still thought it was a, a great idea. And I would, you know, just the idea of sitting up uh, just the way we're sitting right now, right. like sitting across from, from Bobby Orr or Lou Lamarillo or, you know, whomever you want, you know, whichever Hall of Fame, you know, at the time Robbie Alomar hadn't yet got his, you know, banishment from baseball, you know, whomever it would be. And, and being able to just, and then, and, and like when you're talking, you're not talking about, tell me about that play, you know, tell me about your life. How did you get right, there? How right. did you become who you are? You can have a How, real, especially in yeah. person, you can have a real conversation and, with and someone. I, and I love, I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed, am I allowed to mention other podcasts? Oh my God. Yeah, sure. I love Smartless. And I don't know if you listen to Smartless at all. I started, I wanted oh. to listen. And then I heard they had Eddie Vedder on, who's a guy who I know is never going to come in my basement, but I wanted yeah. to hear like a deep dive. And I have to say, I was left a little like empty. Like it felt very safe and kind of a little bit too scripted for me. And it seemed like all the interesting places were out of bounds, but like I, that, that spirit of what they're doing, I absolutely adore. And I think you actually, I proposed this to someone um, who came to, to me out of the blue, uh, a company in Los Angeles approached me and said, would you like to do a podcast? And I said, about what? And they said, we don't know. We just want you to do something. And I, at the time, I had no idea. And then I thought, you know what? You could do a, sm a, a sports version of Smartless. Right. You get three people. Um, and I guess McCowan and John Shannon kind of do that. But you get three people and you bring in one guest and that's your hour. And my only complaint with Smartless ever is they have these, I, I'll use Julia Louis-Dreyfus as, as sure. an example. They had her on that they talk too much. Like yeah, I wanted yeah, to hear her. Right, right. And so sometimes that happens. But I, I... I really liked the concept and I still like the concept and uh, you know, well, it's never too late, but Steve. finding the right people is so important. I right. mean, that's what we had with the reporters. We had a, an unbelievably different group of voices. Like the four of us couldn't think more differently about the same things. And, you know, I, I always say this, I, I had that seat where I had Mike Farber to my right and, right. Da and Dave to my left. And if you ever want to feel like the <laughs> dumb kid in class, you know, take, that'll do it. That'll do it. Two, two of the absolute <laughs> smartest people I've ever known. Wow. Uh, yeah. So hopefully one day, but now, uh, so I'm going to get to some of the comments now. And again, all those people who wrote me and said, uh, you know, tell them to F off or punch him in the nose. Uh, come on, g give me something constructive here. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip all those. Okay. So pretend I punched you in the nose and pretend I told you to F off. Okay, Steve. Okay. Oh. So I'm <laughs> just kidding. Matt cause, uh, and he's being sarcastic here because he put it in quotes, but he said, Steve, you handsome devil. How come everyone loves you on Twitter? So I love Matt. Matt, Matt's a lot of fun, and I I know Matt's dad. Actually, I go back to Matt's dad, Lou Cause. Who you should actually have him on one. Day. I'd have him on. He, he's fantastic. He covered the Leafs. He covered the '67 Leafs, and he's he's written books about the early years of the Blue Jays, and and just a, a quintessential sort of man of. I think I think he's like close to ninety now, but he's like kind of like. He's close to, he's one of these guys that's close to 90 and he's dating people all the time, you know? Yeah. He's got, as long as he has his wits about him, I do it. Now, Brian McFarlane's been on the program. He's in his 90s now, yeah. so. Uh, and he's pretty with it. Last I saw yeah. Brian and talked to Brian as well. Um, how, how many shows have you, you, you said the number when you 1142 started. 1142 is this one right here. 1,142. So in the, in the 1,142 shows, how many times have you said something and as it came out of your mouth, you wanted to grab it? Uh, it's happened a few times, sure. It, 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 you know, I talk a lot, so I'm sure there's a few times. I can't think of one specific, but it, uh, it's probably happened. So when you write 8 million words, there are times when you write something, an entire subject, an entire column, maybe 800 words of an entire column, mm -hmm. and the next day you look at it and you kind of cringe and you say, why did I do that? Or why did I say that? Or, or sometimes you look back a year later and you think, why did I say that? Well, with, with the most recent, you know, situation you wrote something and you looked at it the next day and sentiment i know what i wanted to say 
and delivery, you know, I screwed up. And, um, and in this world today, there's no, you know, escaping online from screwing up, if you want to call it that. And by screwing up, I mean choice of words. Well, okay, let me read, let me read it. So this is in your uh, Sunday notes column. And because uh, I have so many questions about Akeem Alou in that, the comments you made. So, so you wrote, no one wants to say this because of the politically correct police and all, but those who coached Akeem Alou must cringe every time they see him in a news report or a commercial talking about what's wrong with hockey, like he would know. By my count, Alou played for 23 teams in nine different leagues in 12 professional seasons and rarely finished any season with the same team he started with. If that was color-related, how is it that Wayne Simmons spent just about uh, the same 12 seasons playing in the NHL? Well, begin with Wayne Simmons should never have been in the note. There was no reason for it. It was a mistake on my part. It, I believe, inflamed the situation. It, this had nothing to do with Wayne Simmons. This had nothing to do with color. And, and I made the mistake of, of connecting two players that really aren't connected. So the only thing linking those people in your mind is that they're both black men. Well, and they're both, they're both part of the a- Hockey, Hockey Diversity of Alliance. But, um, you know, I, I made a comparison that really wasn't relevant to the point I was trying to make. And the point I was trying to make is that, you know, every time I saw that Bank of Nova Scotia commercial, for one, and many other people I know of, you know, are uncomfortable when they see that. This is not about white and black. This is not, that, that's what bothered me the most about this and how it became, I'm, I'm a racist. But here's um, where I think it is. And again, I, you're going to, obviously, uh, you've got all the time in the world here to, to clarify what you mean, et cetera, except it is black about black and white, right? Because, because Akeem Alou is a black man and he's been very vocal about the difficulties he faced, you know, as a black man in hockey, right? The culture of hockey and a black man. And he's been very uh, upfront about all this. And I'm just, Steve, you and I are both white guys. And uh, how the hell would we know what it was like to be, uh, for Akeem to be a black man playing in hockey these past well, uh, couple we of wouldn't. decades? Well, we wouldn't. We um, wouldn't. But I do know things that I'd rather not get into here um, about, about him. And I do know many people who have played with him, managed him, been his agent, been his coach, um, that kind of thing. And, and, and here's what I would ask you and anyone else, maybe even listening. If I don't like someone or care for how they conduct their business, is that racist? If he happens to be black, what if he's white? Is that racist? No, then? of course not. Like, no, of course so, not. So that's the part that bothers me here. It, and I, and I admit that I I made it, you know, a black and white thing by right. bringing Wayne Simmons in, right? And you know, I'm I'm sick to my stomach, frankly, that I did that, um, and and have been the entire week. But as for what I said about Akeem, other than maybe the last that one that one sort of snarky line, how would he know? Like he would know. Yeah, everything else I said about him. You know, is is absolutely true. So what I would say, okay, again, I, as a guy who reads what you write and respects you, I mean, you're here in my my home right now. This is your third visit. That's not an accident. It's because I respect you as a person and uh, I want to have a conversation with you. Now, okay, so you have something you want to say here about Akeem and maybe there's a, a point you want to make about maybe hypocrisy or something to that effect, but jamming it in like this uh, uh, a couple of like quick hits dot 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 like like your uh you know uh king larry king right it's like well, dot that- dot dot whereas maybe again i'm going to play something in a minute from uh, a friend of the program who was just over here the other day and recorded something uh regarding this that you know and he's a black man i'm going to play that in a minute but it just feels like this re- this deserved a deeper dive and maybe a conversation with Akeem. It just was, it sounds like a bigger story. You're jamming well, into a couple of sentences. The problem and the strength of the Sunday column, which has been running now for 30 some years. Right. And um, I know many coaches over the years that this has driven nuts is that you say something and then there's no, yeah, but, and then you go on to the next point. Right. And I think that's part of what people have come to like and and sort of eat up about the Sunday column, which is the most read column in our chain, which would make it probably the most read column in Canada. 
Uh, so on the one hand, what makes it, you know, attractive is also what can get you in trouble. And um, to use a quote from uh, one of my seniors, yeah. um, um, and, and he's not using the term sun as in the newspaper I work for, but the term sun as in the up, up in the sky, he said, you fly too close to the sun. And when you fly too close to the sun, sometimes you get burnt. And, and we would rather have you flying too close to the sun regularly will deal with the burnt situations when we have to. And over the years, there have been other ones. Um, you know, and, for, and, and I'm, for, I'm not going to make an excuse here, but right. I was writing this notes column while that 10-9 Blue Jays game was going on. <laughs> And so 90% of my focus is I got to write a column on the game that was 8-1 and now it's not and all this. And I got to get this notes column done by 7-something. And so it was like I was a bit fra- – I'm not going to use that as any kind of an excuse, just an explanation for I should have changed that note. All right, And so- I wish I had changed the note. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure the reaction would have been anything at all similar. I'm just going to give you one other – Fact. Of course, yeah, no, I know. Uh, I want to spend the, some time. The on column, it. the column goes out by email. I don't know if you get it on Saturday, but no, I see the tweet and then yeah. I click through. Um, the um, the column goes out to anyone who subscribes. It's just thousands of people. It goes out on Saturday, so this column went out on Saturday afternoon, and um, normally when there's something in there that people will respond to. I will hear things immediately. I didn't hear a word until Ali went online on Sunday morning. So there had not been a single response of any kind, um, which may just you know may play into the fact that people are ostensibly lazy. But but normally when it I might hit, play into like the fact yeah. that the subscribers are Steve Simmons fans yeah. and probably gonna cut you some slack or no because i get i get a fair bit of oh i don't agree with that or i don't agree with this kind of emails and you know people people the one thing about the world today is is people react immediately you get an immediate reaction right and um and because you get an immediate reaction you know sometimes you know when something's you know really good and sometimes you know when you've screwed up so you you didn't get that kind of heads up on the saturday with the email no and, and what got me was it was it was edited, like by you know. I didn't get, and and I had an item in the column. Actually, this is a true story. I had yeah. an item on Jordan Romano about having one of the great seasons of any Canadians ever had for a Canadian baseball team. Mm-hmm. And then Jordan Romano gets you know in trouble in the eighth and gives up runs in the ninth, and the Jays are out. Right. And I called or sent emails to the editors saying remove the Romano. So that kind of thing happens all the time where you put something in and you take something out and, sure. and you have that exchange. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any kind of exchange from anyone who said, you know, do you want to change that? And, and I'm not, I'm, again, it's my writing. I'm, I'll, you know. Well, you published I'll, it. But I stand by it. But again, um, I, you know, there, yeah. there are, are times when you do need help from your editors or, or, or wish you could get help from your editors. Okay, so Steve, enjoy that. Uh, you got your Diet Coke there. Settle in. I have follow-up questions and some specifics for you here because okay. you're on Toronto mic here, the land of the deep dive. But I promised uh, I'm going to play something. Now, I'll just preface this to say that Jason Portwondo and Donovan Bailey are here once a week and they record their fine podcast, which is called Donovan Bailey Running Things, and they cover a variety of topics. In fact, one of the uh, articles I was reading in A Lucky, a Lucky Life, your new book, was what you wrote about Donovan. So it, there's a lot of Donovan talk coming up later. But let me play this. It's a couple of minutes, so get comfortable, and then I'm going to ask you very specific questions. Here's uh, Jason Portwondo and Donovan Bailey from Donovan Bailey Running Things. An article recently written by Steve Simmons, and obviously this being a Toronto-based show, we're talking about the Toronto Sun newspaper. Um, recently, just going to give you the kind of the Coles <laughs> Notes version of the story involving some NHL players who are black, Wayne Simmons being one, Akeem Alou being the other. And in the article, he's saying, you know, you can't compare the two. I guess Akeem Alou was, um, you know, having some statements, made some, you know, references to various things. And he said, well, how can you even, you know, compare the two? Because Wayne Simmons has been a bona fide NHL player. Akeem Alou has played for like 
a bunch of different teams throughout his 20 odd year career. And it definitely raised the eyebrows of many, both the current and former players. Well, okay. I know Steve uh, and I've spoken to Steve uh, many, many times. I'm on the side of Akeem and Wayne. uh, And I'm just going to say this. Uh, Steve, Steve's written bad articles about me and he's probably written some good articles about me. And I, and I have the ability to also call him and talk to him. So I'm going to say this to Steve. You're in a position where you have a pen. You're in a position where you could be, you could do good and you could be influential with the articles that you write. You're in no position whatsoever to criticize an, an, an athlete's journey. You are, you're in no position uh, to talk about, uh, especially a black kid who has, who, who's had to deal with hockey his entire life and, and, and you know, some of the racist uh, systematic, institutional, every kind of racism that this kid could get. So he has absolutely no right to criticize Akeem, has no right to, to criticize Wayne or to bring Wayne in on the conversation. I mean, ultimately, it's 2022, and there are a lot of people out there, and I've said this for 25 years, your job today, if you do not know someone's story or someone's journey, is to shut up and listen and ultimately you know that's what i'm saying to steve i mean at the end of the day uh it would have been great for him it, it, whether or not to it, it, writing that article uh and criticizing uh these guys it would have, it would have been better to actually have a conversation with 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 uh with them about their journey and certainly you can talk about you can always talk about an athlete and their athleticism uh but uh if you know akeem speaks a lot about his journey and dealing with racism and nobody has the right to go in there and criticize that. Akeem, by the way, part of the NHL's diverse... Okay, what say you, Steve Simmons, to what Donovan Bailey well, was saying? Begin with one thing, and Donovan talks about how long of a relationship we have, and it is a very long relationship. Sure. And uh, Donovan got the Order of Canada last year. Um, I was his sponsor. I was the person who, who promoted him to that. And I have been the person for I don't know how many years screaming about the injustice. Okay, because I've been taking credit for this, by the way, because I had Donovan on, and then shortly thereafter, he was named. But yeah. you were the man who was Actually sponsored. went through the paperwork. No, went through the paperwork, and there's a, there's a process that, that's involved. W- which is great. Um, and him and I, you know, we've been talking about, I wrote an article about this, I don't know, it was a top of a Sunday notes column, actually, I don't know how many years ago now, about, you know, he wants to be able to tell his kids that he's order of can. This was before it ever happened. Right. And, and, you know, and one of the things, they had a roast for Donovan's, I, I can't remember, it was 20th anniversary or 25th anniversary, whatever it was, it was a fundraising roast for his ability. Um, one of the speakers at the roast, me. Um, so him and I have had a, you know, sure. for him to say we've had a good and bad, most of it's been pretty good um, over the years. And, sure. and, you know, I, I talked to him probably, I don't know, every few months depending on what's going on. And, and in fact, the Usain Bolt story in the book um, focuses on Donovan watching somebody, you know, break the world record and break the Olympic record that he once broke in, in, under similar circumstances, but very mm-hmm. different. So, so, so there's a lot of layers to our relationship. Sure. I agree, and I, I'll go back to this, just, and I don't want to repeat myself, but Wayne Simmons should never have been mentioned. Okay, so that. maybe there, maybe there was maybe no reason at all. At you all. regret yeah. the whole Wayne Simmons part of yeah. that. Okay, so I I know thing, and I'm not going to go into them because it's it's just not right. I know too much here. I know too much here. I know that doesn't answer people's questions, um, <sighs> but I know too much, and I know too many stories, and I know too many things that um, um, have happened over the years that again aren't necessarily related to race but but how, here's my, here's my, i'm serious i'm asking you this as a yeah. blue-eyed white guy here yeah. okay and, and i know what i don't know how do you know that an experience of uh, like a keem in hockey how do you know it's not related to racism okay what what if the experiences i'm talking about have nothing to do with hockey so this is where i'm i have to tap out i realize okay. because i don't know what you're talking about so okay and, and, and i'm not and i'm not going to what's the word i'm not going to enlighten you okay so because you're gonna hold that water yeah as we say I, in the it's, wire. It's, you know I, I will say one thing yeah um the national hockey league this is a time where everyone is looking for diversity and everyone is looking that's what every corporation and every company and all of that the national hockey league and the hockey 
diversity alliance are not working to they do not work together they are not associated in any way with each other okay i was told the reason by as as good a source as you can get they want nothing to do with akeem that's i'll leave so, it at okay, that okay let me ask you isn't yeah. that the story to write like isn't i've that... already i wrote that like two years ago okay two years ago Okay. Um, when when it happened at and, the but, time. Okay. Then let me let me change it this way. You do you appreciate like like why? Because when I said you got a question, I can't tell you how many. Some of them I I will reference, but so many questions about what you wrote about Akeem Alu and bringing Wayne Simmons into it, and you know one guy there, Fasaruk. I hope I said it right, Fasaruk on Twitter. Uh, thinks I he says uh content over principles eh? like he's basically accusing me like like i shouldn't even have you on like my principles i should not have you on okay but you appreciate the uh the people who feel your your notes about akeem are rooted in racism i I understand because they don't know what this thing you know in your head they don't they don't know of course (laughs) and that's you know when i write about a lot of things people don't know what i know that's that's part of. But being, as a journalist, you you know things you, you, you have can, to document what certain, you know if certain, it applies to the story. Certain things you do and certain things you don't, and you know I'm more comfortable, frankly, not reporting in these circumstances things I know okay. rather than things I don't. And, and again, Mike, is if I could, would I have written the thing? No. So you so know? I guess but so, but, but my yeah. that, that, but it doesn't yeah, yeah. change my view that I don't have much regard for him. So you don't regret, and you only regret bringing Wayne Simmons into it. You don't regret what you wrote about Akeem Alou in that, uh, in those notes, the no, Sunday notes. No, I do not. Okay, so. And, and to be honest, had, it, had that second part not been in there, mm-hmm. I don't think the reaction would have been anything close to what it was. Uh, we'll never know, but I suspect it would have, there would have been a reaction uh, regardless. But okay, so. Uh, so let me just a couple of quick hits here. One, there's so many places I want to go there. Partly, I will say, as as a guy who uh, admires you and uh, respects you, I was kind of hoping you'd come in and apologize. But there's this huge component to the story that you're not ready to 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 share with the public that seems to be influencing your uh, re- one of, refusal one, to do that. One of the things that I believe has separated me from many of my peers over the years. Yeah is I say things people don't want to say. And I say things that are uncomfortable. And so I will tell stories that others won't tell. And I'll, and I'll stick my neck out for that. And I've been doing that for 40 years in different ways. I will, um, you know, talk about, you know, things that maybe other writers know about that won't, they won't approach. And it's been a strength of mine historically and it's been a failing of mine historically, depending on what the circumstances were. And I, I can't change who I am. And so for me to change who I am, you know, I might as well just, you know, get in a car, drive to Florida and, 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 and begin retirement. Okay, on that note, Jeremy Taggart, former drummer for Our Lady Peace and an FOTM like yourself, uh, he writes in and he writes in, when will you do us a favor and retire? And now he's being a dink with that comment there. But uh, on that note, do you have any plans to at some point, uh, you know, put the pen away and, and retire? Two, two things. Um, one, the day I wake up and I'm not thinking what's my column today mm. is the first day I'm going to consider retiring. While I... I'm still, you know, sort of, and to, to do that Sunday column, yeah, the Sunday column is 2,400 words. That's three times the length of an average daily column in a paper. And it's, it's a lot of work right? and it's a lot of gathering and it's, you have to have to write 2,400 words. You have to have about 3000 words of material. And so it's, you know, it's, it's my, I call it my curse and my blessing, but you still love it. I do, and what, what what gets me more than that I love it is that other people love it. Um, two two things that we can now track on, on post media. Mm-hmm. One, how many people read your work? Two, how long are they engaged in your work? That's now, those are things before you never knew. You were just sort of hoping you knew. Right. The right. last I was told, and they don't tend to share this information very often with you, mm-hmm. I had the highest readership in the chain and the, and the longest engagement in the chain. 
And so here I am in my 42nd year or whatever it is of doing this. Yeah. And, you know, when, as, as Mr. Taggart says, when am I going to retire? <laughs> right. If people don't want to read it anymore, I will happily walk away. And, but and, the numbers don't indicate that. And you might be the only uh, person in the chain, as you said, the post-media chain, who can trend on Twitter for four days in a row. Yeah, which I would honestly would wish on no one. Because, <laughs> you know, when you do what I do, yeah. and you take shots, and I'm not using this one as an example, I'm just shots, period. You're going to get them back. Right. And, you know, right. and, and I think, I, ref- no, 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 no. I, I, think I reference in the book, I, yeah. you know, I have, I've been hit probably as many times as George Chavallo. And, you know, and, and he was always still standing, although God bless George, he's not yeah. in real good shape right now. I had a son on uh, um, recently to do kind of a type. Yeah, he's yeah. not doing well these days. Uh, but, you know, he stood in there and took all the shots of, of, of a horrendously painful life. I'm not oh. saying my life has been anything anywhere near that, but I always sometimes feel like if you take one, you better be there to, to get one back. And I've always believed that, you know, when you take one, you show up the next day to face the music. This one, because it lasted as long as it did, it affects your family. It affects your friends. Um, and that's why I don't, I don't hope, I don't want that on, you know. I, I had, we had a bunch of family over yesterday and this is what they wanted to talk about. Yeah. And, and really? I would, well, I was going to ask you when you were coming over here, because uh, sure, we book, I should point out in case people don't know that this was in my calendar well before you wrote those comments about Akeem Alou. Yeah. So this was already in the calendar. We were going to talk, catch up on a ver- variety of subjects and talk about your new book. Well, I was, I was here to talk book. And, oh, I know, and, and, I know. And, and anything else usually you put it, and, I, and I'm happy to answer. And I'm going to give you some res- some props there, which is that it would have been easy for you to say, you know, to cancel because you know I'm going to ask about the Akeem Alou. Like you knew that driving over here, he's going to ask about the Akeem Alou comments. Uh, and you still came over here. You're still sitting here. And I don't feel any pressure from you to censor anything or you didn't say, hey, don't ask me about this. Don't ask me about that. Like I feel very comfortable to ask you anything and you're here facing it. Now you didn't. Like some people are like, oh, Maybe he'll issue this big, broad apology and say, I'm sorry, Akeem, I never should have wrote what I wrote. And you haven't done that. But the fact that you're here to state that to me is uh, something I, I respect. So thank you for doing this, buddy. Yeah, and, and, and I, uh, I appreciate you know, the times that we've had together. And I appreciate listening when I listen to the podcast, which I do quite often. Good. Thank you. No, I love, I love that you listen. Absolutely. love that you listen. So, But we're not quite done yet, but, we're gonna, but this is a nicer note for you. Lee Eckley radio superstar Lee Eckley, who's also an FOTM, he said, Simmons is one of the country's best columnists. Not only a great read, but always an interesting listen. So for every Jeremy Taggart, there's a Lee Eckley. All right. <laughs> You'll take that one. You know what? I, 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 like, I like when someone who's not in your world, but is, um, what do you want to call it? Um, a media personality. Is, is a me- yeah, but it's a media personality and is high up. One of the things that disappointed me the most Mm -hmm. were people that I have known and know personally and have known and had relationships with who suddenly are saying, I'm a racist. Well, that's that's it. Once the R word is attached to you, it's... it's, uh... You know, it reminds me, I I forget who said this. Some some reporter or person said this years ago. You know, it's it's the... uh, I'm I'm trying to get the wording properly. Sure. Um, If you ask someone who assaulted someone when was the last time you beat someone up you know the the implication is um you know right that that and i'm saying this badly but you know i think there's a famous political sentence it's like yeah. so you you accuse someone like yeah. like uh is it true you beat your wife yeah and then they'll say no but they just the fact that they had to deny that they beat their wife is yeah. enough to sort of smear them you know when I, when i was in university when i was in at western yeah and i'm writing for the university paper um they had a football coach at the time named Darwin Simodiak, wonderful old guy who's since passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Argos had an opening for a head coach. Darwin had won, I think, the Vanier Cup the last year or two. And so I phoned up Darwin, working for the student paper, and said, you know, are you interested in the Argos job? And, and he kind of giggled at the time. They didn't look at CIU coaches for those kind of positions. And he said, um, no, I don't really have any interest in that at all. So I wrote a story for the Gazette saying that Darwin Samodiak had no interest in the Argos coaching job. Right. Which essentially <laughs> was true, but it really wasn't. But a it sto- implies it, that he was it uh, wasn't really, offered it or yeah, something. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. really a story of any kind. But, you know, that's sometimes, unfortunately, what right. we do in our business. 
That's amazing. Now, uh, Steve says, uh, see you at Bagel World on Sunday. So do you do you go to Bagel World on Sundays or is um, it? My son is a more of the Bagel World guy okay. than I am. I'm kind of the Center Street Deli guy. Center Street Deli. Okay, then get one of those questions coming up. But Dan, right? Okay, so Dan and James, are, uh, several people sort of uh, made snarky comments uh, regarding uh, J- Jose Batista. Like, hey, Steve, remember that time Jose Batista burned you on Twitter? That tweet was... Uh, more well written than anything you've ever done. That one goes to James, and then Dan just I got, writes. I, can it I in. stop? In, can I stop in right now? Yeah, of course. Um, I can't remember what create. Oh, I I tweeted something about Batista, and then I got one back from him, and it was a really good one, to be honest. It's who um, are you and why are you talking to okay. me? Okay, uh, Jose. <laughs> but I I got a a phone call that morning, the morning of that tweet from Alex Anthopoulos and Paul Beeston. On a, you know, when you have two people on the, on the phone at the same time. Of course. So they're calling me and just laughing their whatever's (laughs) off. (laughs) Jose Batista had a company in New York that handled his social media. They weren't even certain that he was aware that this tweet had been sent out. Uh, Of course, when, when I mentioned that, uh, he denied that, which may have been the people in New York denying it as well. Yeah. And when I went up, I, I, I didn't see him again. This was maybe October or November or something. Um, when I went and saw him in spring training, and the first day I was there, I, of course, made my way over to discuss, you know, wh- what's going on with us. You know, he, you know, he kind of shooed the whole thing off as, as being nothing. And we never had a bad relationship of any kind after that. So, it might have been so, a social media team. So, so what, ha- what happens in, in this is, again, the real world and the yeah. Twitter world don't always intersect. And, it, and as one of, my, um, one of my friends in the business pointed out, about 20% of people we know are on Twitter, which means 80% aren't. Right. Now... Take that to the next level. About five percent of the people on Twitter are active, based on on the research that we have. Sure. So you're getting five percent of twenty percent, and which basically is telling you that my math is bad. Um, that ninety percent of the public has no idea what's going on online. Right. right. And so sometimes in the media, we get so consumed with the Twitter reaction and the Twitter war and all of that. And, you know, and in this case... And that's case, not the real world. No, and it isn't. And you have to... And, and again, I'll, mm-hmm. if, if the sun had been barraged in the same way social media barraged me, right? they may have been far more... What's the word? I don't know if concerned is the right way to put it, but um, but again, there's a realization there that you know, the mob mentality of hate on Twitter or reaction on Twitter and and what the real world is aren't always the same things. So to be clear here, let's just spell this out for people. You you didn't have a, after the Akeem Alou uh, comments you wrote, you didn't have any uh, boss or something that pulled you in a room or called you up and just in, and disciplined you in any way or, or asked you to, I don't know, retract it or write, nobody, Not, anything like that. Almost the opposite. There was support, as I said, that right. line about flying close to the sun. There was because you got engagements. We, we no, it wasn't even that I got engagements. I don't think it was that. Okay, it's it's we want you to be who you are, right? And if sometimes that means crossing the line, you know, we'll deal with the crossing the line um, because we like all the other parts. Um, now, you know, who knows, you know what they think today necessarily because I haven't taught, but I've had no, like, you know, you're seeing today that everyone and his mother is getting suspended and, 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 you know, whatever for saying this or for doing that. Um, I have never lost a day's work in, in, you know, 42 years in the newspaper business. And I've got a great, great comment here from Mike Rogotsky, but just before, uh, again, looking in the eyes here, you're only a few feet away from me to those people who say you're racist. What do you say to them right now? I've grown up Jewish. If anyone in in this city or anyone in this country understands racism, it's people who have grown up Jewish. Um, the number one hate crimes in this country, across the country, is against Jews. Um, you learn from a very young age to understand 
you know, Nazi Germany and what happened and what hate is. And we use a word called never again. And anyone who knows me, anyone who knows me, knows how I think, knows what I do, knows that at times I've written tolerance literature for groups, understands that the last thing in the world that I am is a racist. Mike Rigotsky writes, great to see Simmons is coming back. Can you ask Steve why he thinks people are so quick to rush to the defense of their hometown slash favorite player when something is written slash reported critically of the player? I've never really understood this. I want to hear criticisms of teams and players when they are not doing well, not just praise when they are winning. Thanks. Toronto's a strange town as a sports town um, because um, in, in a New York, in a Philadelphia, in a Boston, the players get savaged. The players really get attacked unlike they do here. They really don't. We're pretty easy on players. This is a tough town to be a GM. This is a tough town to be a coach. This city eats through GMs and coaches. And, um, and that's what, for whatever reason, that is how, what, whether that's media driven or whether that's, um, you know, publicly driven, I don't know, but you can't say a word about a leaf player without, you know, causing a, a brouhaha of some kind. And yet say anything you want about Kyle Dubas, say anything you want about Sheldon Keith. And, and it goes, you know, the same things. You know, when the Blue Jays lost, I didn't hear anybody said, you know, Vladimir Guerrero was up with two two on and, and nobody out and, and, and had a chance to, to do what Bryce Harper did and, and didn't get it done. Um, but why did John Schneider do that? And why did he pull Gossman when he did? And right. And this is how, this is Toronto. And I don't know, I can't explain it, but I do know that, you know, other than, you know, when they hate, a Larry Murphy or whomever it happens to be, Matt Sundin in his early years with the Leafs. When it when it's that kind of thing, you know, that's different. Justin Hole right now, I think, is in that in that group. But, you know, you can't like you saw I don't know if you saw the Leaf game last night, but Mitch Mitch Marner had two like yeah. dreadful giveaways that led to goals and he got benched for a little bit. And right. And, you know, you know, just it's some no one's going to come out and and rip Mitch Marner because in Toronto that's just not done. You know, I think you're right about that. Maybe there's a bit of a supply and demand at play there, but uh, you're absolutely right. You can you can it's our, our I mean, I was reading some, you know, hot takes on the the weekend that uh Dubis and Keith should go right now. Like uh go. They're like, "Oh, you know, Babcock Babcock was like, well, I don't know, the similar record at the similar time when they said goodbye to him." And it's like, you know, go. And it's just it's uh just the way the city is. I well, suppose. Babcock went, and and it, at the firing of Mike Babcock, I don't think anyone objected to. You can tell when you watch a team on a daily basis, and when you watch how the team interacts with the coach, you can tell when it's over. It's pretty easy to tell. And if you're there all the time, you have even a better sense. Um, and Mike Babcock was going to be fired, I believe, the weekend before he was fired, but it was the Hockey Hall of Fame weekend, mm. And Brendan Shanahan did not want to sort of up upstage the Hockey Hall of Fame. Which Fames. is pretty classy of him. So then the Leafs, I think, played in Pittsburgh and then went to... Did they go to Arizona when they fired him? I forget exactly what the circumstances were. But I think I think they went to the West Coast and, and he got fired there. And it was pretty obvious. And it was Grey Cup week. I'm in Calgary. It was Grey Cup week. Right. And so I'm out there covering the Grey Cup and now I'm covering, you know, Babcock's firing. Right. Um... Uh, but but when you see that separation between pl t players and coach, it becomes pretty obvious. And when you're watching the Leafs right now, the circumstances that led to Babcock's firing, I think he was 9, 10, and 4. So there's a, still a, a number of games to get to, right. to, to be where they were when it happened. Um, but they've lost to the three worst teams in the yeah. NHL. Right. They've lost. I mean, I think that to me is the most damning thing. They, they've lost to Anaheim, San Jose, and Arizona. And that's pain. That's painful to me. Like, um, like I, I, if, I, if I'm a Leaf fan, that hurts a lot. Um, and, I, and so there is a lot of questions to ask about what's going on here with this club 
and with this direction and with these players and with this team that hasn't won a playoff game in in in, in a hundred years, I haven't won around since two thousand and four when Pat Quinn was behind the bench. And and so, you know, they started this season with we have you know we have a job to do. We have to you know get get to this point, and we have to be ready to 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 be able to to go ahead in the playoffs. And and the GM said, I like the roster, and the coach said, I like the roster, and everybody was happy. Uh, and then they start playing, right. And right. and right now that you know they are looking right now like a team that's heading to a firing of some kind, whether they are or aren't, you know, you know, a, a win Wednesday night, you know, changes the narrative completely. Right. And so, but you you can sense when things aren't right with team. It's not that hard. It's not that complicated. You know, when a team that's second in the NHL in scoring is now not scoring, you know, you know, you got to ask questions as to why. Gene Valaitis, you know, uh, you remember Jesse and Gene. I love Gene Valaitis. He writes in, uh, I'd like to hear about the story when he and Jim Taddy went to fan management about their day, their midday show and the ego problems they were having with each other and both were fired on the spot. That was wild. Well, t- actually, it's not true. Okay, let's get the it's, truth. Uh, here's the truth. Mary Ormsby and I did the first year together on the fan. And this is how long ago it is in terms of time. Mm-hmm. The star, the star asked her or told her to quit because they didn't want her giving away her ideas right. and her thoughts for free. If you want to hear radio. what Mary thinks, you got to subscribe yeah. to the uh, and, Toronto Star. You know, the opposite, of course, is true today. <laughs> you know, everybody wants you on as much media as possible. Right. You know, the, the more radio, the more television, the more whatever. It's, it's good for the brand. Um, so, so I tried to find a co-host to work with me in the second year. And they said, okay, you know, see if you can come up with somebody. And my first, um, my first reaction or first thought was Rod Smith, who at the time was a reporter for TSN. Rod and I had a pretty good relationship, and he, you know, he's got the voice of God. He's and, got great pipes. And he's just a, um, I don't know if you know Rod, I've ever had Rod on. He's been here, yeah. He is one of the great people of all time. Like, I just love Rod. Great FOTM. And, um, and, but TSN wouldn't let him do it. At the mm-hmm. time, again, at the time, the fan was not, uh, Rogers related or the TSA. No, it was, was like telemedia yeah. or something. Yeah. Yes. But they wouldn't give him the go ahead to take the two hours a day it, it took. So I wasn't coming up with who I needed to come up with. And, uh, and so they brought in Taddy and, and to be honest, I didn't like the show, but I didn't hate the show and I didn't really like him, but I didn't hate him. Like I just, it, it wasn't comfortable. And you could see that we didn't have a lot of chemistry. Right. So at the end of the year, um, Taddy went in to management. I, I had nothing to do with it or no knowledge of this at all. And basically said, either he goes or I go. And I think whoever the program director at the time was, might have been Nelson Millman, said, you both go. Wow. And that was sort of the end of my first run of three times, oh. I think I was at the fan. Okay. Um, that, that's what happened. And uh, yes, guy. Yeah. And I, and I put a note in the Sunday column, two words, <laughs> two words. I never want to hear again. Yes, guy. <laughs> and, uh, and here's Taddy. What's the third? And we actually get along fine. Now we've done some radio shows together and we, we, we get along fine. And I think we've joked about this a little bit, you know, what you do, you know, when you're a certain age and what you do all these years later are different. And he's, he's like, you know, completely reinvented himself. A, a TSN radio. Well, he's doing where he's, stuff with Perry Lefko. Yeah, he's got the show Former with Perry son, Lefko. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but he also um, he also fills in a lot for for Maddie Cause in the afternoon and when the morning right. guys are away and when when they need somebody in the summer for for overdrive and so Jim is and, he, and I think he hosts the Leafs and Raptors pre and post game shows. On yeah, radio. I know he's doing so, that. You know what? No tag days for <laughs> for Jim Taddy now. He's doing just fine, and uh, you know. What happened 28 years ago is... Water happened. under the bridge there, I Stop, suppose. You move on. You move on. Now, listen, I uh, I tried to reunite the uh, the duo I loved from Sportsline growing up. Uh, I happened to co-host a show of Mark Hebsher. So, in fact, he was in my backyard last Thursday for Halloween 2022. Shout out to Canna Cabana. They were fantastic on that episode. Canna Cabana will not be undersold on cannabis or cannabis accessories. Over 140 locations across the country. Do you That's know, where, go ahead. Do you know I, I, I met Mark Hebsher before either of us were in the business? How? 
His father and my father were in the same industry. I had, what industry was that? Lady, uh, women's clothing or clothing. I think okay. I think his dad was in. My, my father was. Well, that's what hum, Humble Howard's dad was in, but that was in Moose they, Job. They uh, called it the Schmutta business okay. in Toronto in those days. Okay, and my father. And that's Yiddish. Yeah, my father man Schmutta is Yiddish for rags. Okay, um, I think I've heard Hebsey say that. Um, my dad manufactured and sold, you know, women's wear for that was his business and was very successful. Um, so maybe we're 18, 17, I don't okay. know how old, and we're going out to dinner in Florida. My dad, I'm going with my buddy's family for dinner. Uh -huh. So here, I think his name was Sid, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, it is Sid. Yeah. Yeah. Sid and my dad were either friends or professional friends. And so, you know, Mark wow. and I, and I remember we were playing sports trivia. Okay. Like in a restaurant. And, and, and you know how competitive he is. Yes, like he's he, very competitive. He can't Especially at sports trivia. Yeah. He can't lose. And, and Did you beat him? I, I think we were, I don't know if I beat him <laughs> or if we, we just went at it pretty well. Wow. And I think I was surprised at how much he knew and he was surprised at how much I knew. Wow. And, it was, you know, it's funny years later, of course, you know, he becomes national and, you know, with, with Taddy on Global Sports Line, a historical show. Yeah. And, and I get to where I get to. Wow. You know. I had no idea. So I co-host uh, Hebsey on Sports every Friday morning with Mark Hebsher. And Jim Taddy is the reason we, didn't, we never did the reunion show because Taddy didn't want to look back. He told me he wasn't interested in talking about the past and that sort of killed that idea. So uh, it's funny. I'm, no I'm, guy. I'm the opposite. I, like, I love talking about the Most past. people I, do. I talk, I, I, I talk about the past like, ad nauseum to, to, to friends of mine and, and my family and things like that. <laughs> can, can, we, can we get back to 2022, please? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I could. Well, that's what I do on Toronto Mike. That's what we're doing right now. Rodriguez, um, if you want to ask real talk type questions, ask him why he goes after people with hateful, misleading, informed questions and comments he knows will rile up the people he's talking to. So I read that verbatim. I don't know if he means uninformed because he's kind of making a point there, but what would you say to Rodriguez there? I, I, I'm not, I, I would need a reference as to what questions he's referring to. Right. Uh, B, I happen to think that one of my real strengths as a journalist is my ability to interview. And uh, funny, a quick story. Um, I was away from the Leafs for I don't know how long. I can't remember what injury. I've had a lot of injuries in the last couple of years, and, and oh. I can't remember what the injury it was, but it kept me at home for a while. And I, and I showed up at, at, at Leafs. I, the Leafs were on the road, and I showed up on the road. And one of the regulars on the beat says, thank God you're here. And I said, why? He says, we miss your questions. <laughs> Is that because people are afraid to... to well, I, I upset the player because they could lose their credentials or no, something. No, or no, nothing like that. You don't nothing lose. Like that. You don't lose credentials. Okay, there are people who ask questions in, in a certain way. There are people who who kind of lob the softballs, if you want to call it that. Sure. Sometimes, especially on deadline, I can be very direct. So cut to the chase. I'll, I'll use. Uh, I remember Leafs were playing Boston in the playoffs in one of the years and. And Austin Matthews and his line, I think, had no points in the series. And and um, the Bergeron line had like 14 points. Right. You know, I think it was four games in or three. I don't remember exactly what it was. And I asked him a question. And you could see like the, the reporters were all kind of, <gasps> and I'm thinking like, what is wrong with the question? He has no points. They have a pile of points. Like that's a legitimate question. And so sometimes I think people are so not a, um, What's the word? Not used to direct questions, right. especially in sports where we kind of softball it more often than, than not. Um, so when a direct one comes in, it seems a bit shocking to some of the people around. And so f for years, like a post-game press conference, a pre-game press conference, any of those, none of that stuff was televised. None of that stuff ever got on the radio. None right. of that stuff made it to, like today with, again, the world of, of, of social media and Instagram and Twitter and all these things, every time a leaf opens his mouth, it's online. Right. And so every single interview and every single question, I've been in, I've been in press conferences where I ask a question before I've even gotten the answer for the question. I have an email sent to me saying that was a dumb question, <laughs> you know, from uh, just a, a reader. Um, <laughs> Or that was a really good question. Like, like right. you get instant, instant response now to everything. And so I think people are 
so easily offended by someone who is direct. And, you know, I think sometimes you have to be direct. Well, this is, that's a nice segue into Craig's question. And Craig writes, I guess I'd want to know what it's like having all that hate spewed at him all the time. It can't be fun. Does he ever wake up and wonder if it's all worth it? Has there been times he's wanted to quit? But then he he wants you to know it's from a longtime reader of your column who's been reading you for more than 30 years. I think balance is really important. And I think talking to the people that you're around, um, I I don't want to sound egotistical for a minute, I work in an office in my home, yeah. and I am surrounded by awards. And and I am. I, I hate to say this, but there's like 25 of them on the wall. Right. And, and so if you're having a bad day and you look over and you see that little plaque that says Canadian Football Hall of Fame, or you look over and you see Queen Elizabeth, you know, medal, whatever that medal of honor thing is that, that they, that they gave out yeah or, or you see um what they used to have the edward dunlop awards of excellence or you see one or, or or any of or you see the award for sports writer of the year or or any of those things uh even something simple like i have, I have coach of the year awards for minor hockey like that's you know what if if you're sure of who you are and then you get a little bit of re you know, sort of endorsement sometimes from Some what's validation. around you. Validation. Yeah. Then, yeah, some days are bad and some weeks are worse than others. But, you know, 8,000 8, columns or whatever it is later, you know, I always, I always find, and I find every time I have a conversation with a critic, mm-hmm. by the end of the conversation, he's no longer a critic. And... I've seen it happen in bars so many times when you'll get, you'll start with the you're an a-hole and, and get into that. And, and then five minutes later, oh, could you, could you post for a picture? Right. Can you get, um, a, get a selfie with you? And, and, and that's what you find when you talk over things, when you talk out things, um, you know, you can, the, the Ty Domi story is in the book. And I, I think it's one of the great um, things that, that happens in people's lives. I sc- Sunday column gets me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I scrambled the letters of Ty Domi's name after he punched Alf Sam, sucker, sucker punched Alf Samuelson, and I scrambled the letters of his name, and I it and it came to me idiot. <laughs> right. And of course, you write that you better be at practice the next day or two. Right. To face the music, so I walk in the leaf room. Doug Gilmore yells before I even I'm barely in the room. He's here. Like it was obvious that the players were waiting for me to be walking in. Right. I walk in and I go over to Domi and and Domi starts telling me about the history of his name and the uh, his Albanian background and and what this name means and how much it meant to it means to his father and and you know and you know you insulted my family and you insulted this and you insult and and I'm listening to it all. Right. And then I start explaining you know when you write for a newspaper you're not writing for the players. You're writing for the readers and, and went into the whole thing. And then we start talking just conversationally. At that time, Max was playing minor hockey and my kids were playing minor hockey. And, um, and so we started talking about minor hockey. And then we started talking about boxing, which I have a love of and sure. he has a love of. And which fights have you been to and which ones have you covered and, and which, which did you get to? And we wound up talking for probably 40 minutes in all, which you can't, of course, that can't even happen today in today's world. You right. don't get that access and that kind of conversation. But at the end of the conversation, I walk away, he walks away. You know, 30 years later, I still get texts from Ty Domi. Wow. Um, we still have a relationship of some kind. You know, are we close friends? No. But was I able to communicate with him and, and have an understanding with him and have a relationship with him because we were able to talk about how it was I did my job and how it was he did his. And, and so you have that conversation. And, I, and I've had that several times with other people with similar results. And I find historically that's been, you know, for me, some of my best relationships. I mean, Doug Gilmore wrote the foreword to this book. Doug Gilmore and I were not always on the best of terms, 
But one of the reasons I wanted to pick them is because we had so many years of being in the same place at the same time, right. whether it was Calgary or whether it was Toronto or whether when he was in St. Louis and leading the NHL in playoffs and scoring, I was covering the series because the Flames were playing them. So I went to cover one world championship. Who was, who was on Canada? Doug Gilmore. Mm -hmm. uh, like like every, it seemed everywhere he went, I went. And so that's why I wanted to, to ask him if he would write a forward for the book. Yeah, and it's great too. And uh, you you just said the word historically. So when you said the word historically, I remembered a question that came in from Tim Phelan. Tim's question for you is, why does he continually use the word historical in his columns when he means historic? Probably because <laughs> I need to be edited better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, right. uh, you know what? I, <laughs> I have things that I do like that. I think we all do as writers. You have sure. things you rely on and they, they just become part of it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is. And do, would you want to be a thousand percent grammatically correct all the time? Absolutely. I like Michael McMillan's question here. Well, the last part anyways. He writes, uh, he said politically correct people would take issue with him. His embarrassing with, he, he's a typo here. I'm going to edit it for you. I, this is, I'm your editor, Michael McMillan. He said politically correct people would take issue with his embarrassing and clueless take on Akeem Alou. Since that's an eye-rolling term only scared boomers use, is he one... And does he agree with his employer's Trumpian view of the world? I'm very <laughs> quiet right now. <laughs> um, be, not because I, I want to avoid the question, but because I'm as... One of the nice things about working for The Sun and working for Toronto Sun Sports is we know we've historically had a great sports section. And, yes. And... and and most of you have been over here, by the way. You're all and, great. You know, we've, and a lot of us have been there a long time. Yeah. And, and you know, we have been pumping it out for a long, long time at a pretty high rate. Um, Shout out to Beezer, by the way, yeah. while we're talking. Okay. An Etobicoke guy, not far from here. He should be the mayor of Etobicoke. Um, and, and I, was, I was sad, by the way, Mark Grimes lost. I don't know if it Oh, no, I was, uh, I was a big fan of Amber Morley. So, okay. Uh, I just but, know Mark because of his involvement with sports. Right. I don't yeah. know much else about him. But. He had a good run. Yeah. It was time to change things up in this award. My point is, is that, um, oh, I'll use Buffery. Buffery as an example. Yeah. I think Buffery and I couldn't be more politically different. Right. You know, do well, we work together? Do we love each other? Do we, are we great friends? All these things. Yeah. Yes. But politically, he thinks one way, I think another way. Right. Um, when you work for the sun and they go in one direction, it doesn't mean as a sports writer that I have anything to do with what that direction is. Well, you're covering sports. Yeah. And, and every once in a while, you know, do I, do I cringe? Sure. Um, as, as does anyone that works for any newspaper, to be honest. Well, you know, I because, talked... because the problem, the problem with the world now yeah. and the media world, the day of the impartial newspaper right. is over. Right. Like every paper has a leaning. Every network has a leaning. It's, you know, everybody does it. It's, when you, uh, I'll use it more than any, when you watched how Doug Ford was covered or Rob Ford was covered in their mayoral races or provincial races, compare, and you compare it paper, newspaper to newspaper, you wouldn't think reading the papers that they were even the same people. I mean, that's how different the coverage was. Now your your paper we we there was a I think it was Canada Land that uncovered the the memo that your paper was basically going to uh, act as a I would say again not the sports department but uh, a sort of a propaganda arm for the uh, progressive conservative party in this province like that was uh, I read those documents on CanadaLand.com yeah and and if you go to um, down to One Young Street where the Toronto Star I think they are they still there they might I have think moved they've out. moved. I don't know. Uh, I got Edward Keenan in here next week. In my, in my head, I'm always thinking one one <laughs> yeah. young street to me will always sort of represent of the Toronto Star, just as 333 King should represent the sun, even though we're not there anymore either. Right. Um, you know, the, they're pro-liberal. They've always been pro-liberal. Sure. They, you know, the liberals do no wrong. Um, that's the way the world is. Mm -hmm. And 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 so, what should papers be right down the middle? Absolutely. Is that world over? In this country, I believe it is, and I suspect it's... I, I'm not as familiar editorially 
with how the papers in the United States are. So you're not a staunch conservative, uh, even though you work for the Sun. I'm a, I would call myself a centrist. A centrist. So I will agree with things on the left, and I will agree with things on the right, and and I will agree with what I believe to be right, and it's got nothing to do with leaning politically in any one direction. Now, I started our conversation by saying I just had the pleasure of meeting Liz Braun. I loved it. Now, Liz, who I follow on Twitter, yeah, I would say uh, leans uh, to the left uh, heavily. And uh, she's often tweeting wonderful things about Justin Trudeau, etc. So it's, you know, there's some evidence that all because you work for the Toronto Sun doesn't mean you have to adopt all the, uh, the, 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 the parlance, etc. Well, one of the things I found, again, I can only speak for how, myself and how they treat me, yeah. is no one has ever said to me, you can't say this. Whether it's politically or or, right. or sports or whatever, no one has ever said that. Amazing, um, and that's you know I think there's a certain you know we've gone through a lot of what's the word change at the Sun. You know we went through the most exciting period you could ever live through as journalists in the time when when the Sun was that hot great new um, place to be, and we you know we've been sold a number of times later and and reduced people wise you know so many you know, circumstances over the years. And there's a, there's a thing on, on Facebook called Toronto Sun Family, and it's all it ever talks about are the good old days. Sure. Well, sometimes I want to put my hand up and say, wait a minute. <laughs> if, if the good old days are over, yeah. what am I doing right yeah. now? And, and like, I sometimes think I'm doing the best work of my life, right? I'm 65 years old, and I think I'm doing the best work I've ever done. Um, and, and yet, you know, I keep being told about the good old days. Well, <laughs> yes, they were amazing days, and working for Doug Creighton and and, and Paul Peter Worthington and people like that, well, that was an experience that you'll never get back. Um, but that said, you can, especially as a columnist, I always say it's like handing someone a blank piece of paper to start the day, and then you hand it into the professor at the end of the day. Here's my column, and if the column is good. It's because you you did a good job, and if the column stinks, it's because you stunk, and it's really it's got nothing to do with how good, how bad, how left wing, how right wing, however politically the newspaper tends to be. I, I wrote a column the other day. I'll, I'll use it as an example sure. about um, the relationship between Mark Curtin, the former Maple Leaf, and Boria Salming. Now, the great Maple Leaf suffering from ALS, and both gentlemen have ALS. And Curtin has become, I don't know if the voice of the family is, is the best way to put it, but here's a guy who played, I think, 11 games for the Leafs. And, you know, here he is as, as a great confidant now of Borea Salming, who's just going through the, the world's worst disease, as they both are. Um, and, and when you write one of those and you know you've hit on a, on a nerve, usually based on the first couple of re responses you get, you know, you've hit on, on a good one. Right. You know, it's not because the paper's right wing or left wing or, or Lori Goldstein is writing about climate control again. Um, <laughs> you know, wh whatever it, it is, it's about you that day. And that's the beauty of the column writing. And not to go back to the book, but to me, no, go the, back as because I'm going to spend some time in the book. To shortly. go back to the book is, is that's what shows in there. And one of the things that, where the book came from, a bunch of us were sitting around, and by, by a bunch of us, I mean friends, not newspaper people, not people in the business. We're mm -hmm. sitting around and playing, where were you when this happened? Whether it be man on the moon or Kennedy assassinated or whatever happened to happen in history, where were you when, this, when you first heard this news? And then we started talking about sports. And it was like, where were you when Crosby scored the golden goal or when this happened or that happened? And we went through about 10 different things. Uh -huh. It was like, I was there. I was there. I was there. And, and then it started to hit me. I don't know if anyone else was there. Like, at, not at any one of them, but at all of them. Right. And you're thinking, maybe the last 40 years of sport, I was fortunate enough to be at virtually every where were you moment. From the Batista bat flip to Robbie Alomar's home run in, in Oakland to, to Ed Sprague's pinch hit home run in the World to Series. Donovan Bailey's to Donovan gold Bailey's medal in Atlanta. Go, two gold medals two. in Atlanta. Both of them. He loves Saturday nights in yeah, Atlanta. That was, those were spectacular. They were going to cancel the first one, by the way. They were because of the bomb. The bomb right, went of off course. the night before. Oh, um, 
but you you know you go through um you go through things and 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 it was like this and then right about the same time as we're having this conversation Walter Gretzky dies and I'm thinking to myself I was at Wayne Gretzky's last game and I was at his I think first three Stanley Cups uh, and at 98 when he didn't shoot in the Olympics I, I've been around Gretzky an awful lot yeah. over the years and I was really pleased with what I wrote about that last game in New York and I remember getting a letter from Mike Barnett at the time, who was Gretzky's agent, you know, sort of, you know, congratulating me for hitting the nerve. And, and the piece was all about father and son and how, you know, from the time our kids are little and they go to hockey for the first time, we take them maybe fully dressed coming from home and then we put, tie their skates and, and do all that. And it's, it's kind of a, a tale of father and son. And this is his last game. And who does he want to go to the rink with? He wants to go with his dad. Love it, and uh, and that and when Walter died, and it was national news, like it was like big on CBC and CTV. This wasn't just a small story. I thought, I I have to write this book. I have to put it together, and not only that, I have to lead it off with the Gretzky piece. And so the first the first piece in the book is about Wayne and Walter, and I can read that honestly. I hate to say this because it's my own work. I can read that piece all the time, and and have a little tear in my eye for most of it. Steve Cole would like you to know that your episodes were very good. He's talking about your two previous episodes of Toronto Mike. He says they were very good. He had a small email. Uh, he had a great email conversation with you after you kicked out the jams. Uh, the current issue, he's referring to the Akeem Alou issue again, uh, which you wrote about Akeem Alou. The current issue requires retraction and apology, but all the other stuff, hot dog, etc., is just a columnist being outspoken and opinionated. It's just sports, and people who are so venomous need to get a hobby. I'm not sure there's, there's anything to add <laughs> from, from that. Yeah, uh, we should just point out you are not retracting or apologizing for the Akimalu uh, comments. Uh, just to be clear here, because he thinks that requires, but you say uh, based on well, what you know, that does not re well, required. I should not have used, and I've said this already, should not have used Wayne Simmons' yeah, name. Yeah, that's true. And, um, and that I've been real clear on. Leave it on that. Okay. Uh, and Kevin's curious, have you ever, uh, have you had any conversations with Akeem Alou or Wayne Simmons since you wrote the, uh, like, have you told Wayne that you regret, have you actually apologized to him in any regard? I would love to explain exactly what happened uh, out of privacy and out of respect for Wayne. I will not. Now, speaking of uh, being accused of racism, uh, Elephants and Stars writes in, how did you feel when Cito called you uh, a racist? He's wondering if the benefit of hindsight now, uh, how did, like, I mean, this is not the first time that our word has been flowing at you. Well, here, here's an interesting thing. That was, I forget the year, I think maybe 96, but I don't remember the year. Yeah. Cito Gaston, in a column that Heather Bird wrote for the Toronto Sun, uh, accused three people in the Toronto media of being racist. Bob McCowan was one, David Langford of the Globe and Mail was the other, and I was the third one. Um, Paul Beeston was horrified when the story came out, and I got a call from Beeston almost immediately saying, you know, we're going to fix this. And I said, great. And so what he arranged was individual meetings for each of the three of us with Cito. Okay. And um, I, again, I'm going by memory here, so I'm not, sure. may not be 100% 100, 100 clear on everything. I think McCowan went first, and he went in with a lawyer, and maybe another lawyer, and the program director from the fan. And like there was a posse of about five of them in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that the meeting was very um, tense and didn't really go anywhere. Okay. Dave Langford went in with editors from the Globe and maybe even senior management. And I'm not sure if a lawyer was there. Whatever it was, a posse of some kind. About five of them, I think, went in. And the meeting was not very progressive. I, I think was third. And I went in by myself. My sports editor at the time, Scott Morrison, asked, do you want me to come with? And I said, no, I'll do this. And what I did was I, I went to our library first. Uh -huh. We had a digital library in those days. And I asked the librarian to print out every reference I had made to CETO over a five-year period. And and so I had a, a file about that yeah, thick. Yeah, I bet. It's very uh, thick. 400 or so pages. 
of every, every reference that his name and my name were in the same circumstance. And I went through it and I took a, a highlight pen and I highlighted every time his name appeared. And so I walk into the boardroom at Skydome. So one of those boardrooms, it looks like succession. One of those boardrooms <laughs> right. with a long table. Right. And seated right at the end is Cito. And Gordash, the general manager, is there. And Paul Beeston is there. And um, and as I come in and sit down at the other end of the table, so now we're at opposite ends of the table, uh, they leave. They don't say a word. They just both walk out the door of, of the boardroom. And so here is like, I'm sitting at one end. Cito's sitting at one end. You know, nobody's saying a word. I get up. I walk down to where he is. I put the file in front of him. And I said, please tell me where I've been racist. And he starts thumbing through and thumbing through. And he gets to, I don't know, maybe 10 pages or I don't know how many. And uh, he clearly, you know, reference to his pitching or reference to his bullpen or reference to this or reference to there's There are no, there are, you know, there is no reference to anything. So then we just start having a conversation. And he starts telling me about growing up in San Antonio and how it was time of segregation and they couldn't go to the same restaurants other kids couldn't go to and they couldn't go to the same washrooms and the same hotel rooms. And in minor league baseball, same thing. He was separated from, from the white players and, and how he had come over time to mistrust white people, basically, was, was part of our conversation. And, and we're having a really good conversation about where he comes from and where I come from. And, and I said to him, what do you think of Don Baylor? At the time, Don Baylor, I think, was with the Baltimore Orioles. And Don Baylor was like the guy who went from first to third harder than anybody in baseball. And he was like, he was the, the base runner every manager wanted. Yeah. And he said, I love Don Baylor. Why? I said, in my business, I'm Don Baylor. I said, nobody goes harder first to third than I do. Nobody, you know, nobody outworks me. Um, that's just how I've chosen to approach the job. And we got to a point where, where he had basically said that he confused criticism and or analysis with racism. Mm. And we, had, we spoke for maybe an hour in that boardroom by ourselves, shook hands, I left. I was in my car not 15 minutes and my phone rang. It's Beeston calling. And he says, I don't know what just happened in there, but he thinks you're terrific. Wow. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? And, uh, and uh, he said, well, he didn't have a very good meeting with McAllen. He didn't have a very good meeting with Langford. Um, your meeting really, really got to him. And again, that's going back to conversations sometimes can, can cure misunderstandings. Um, and, and for, to this day, what is this? How many years later? It's, it's yeah. 25 or so years later. I wish I could tell you the year this happened. Um, if I pick up the phone and call Cito for an interview for anything I'm working on column wise or whatever, we'll talk for 15 minutes before mm -hmm. I eventually get to asking him whatever questions I'm going to ask him. So the, you know, that's how a, a bad thing can turn into a good thing. Um, circumstantially. Good. That's great how that turned around. Now, earlier you were talking about how uh, we have we're soft on players in this market. I think I won't put words in your mouth, but you basically said uh, we're tough on the management and the coaches, but not so much on the players. But bleed white, sorry, bleed blue and white. Right. Uh, how does he feel about NHL players not wanting to come here because of the rabid media in this town? And how does he feel about being the poster boy uh, for? He goes. Uh, Mm, same money and be left alone or be a nobody in another city and play hockey mad Toronto. Okay. They basically, he's suggesting maybe some players choose elsewhere because you're here, but I, I think that's about the most nonsensical thing I've ever heard. <laughs> um, a lot of players don't want to play in Canada. Um, both Canadian and American hockey players, partly for the focus, the daily focus that you face while playing in a Canadian market. Mm -hmm partly for the taxes you pay, um, you know, partly for the weather. So, you know, but there are players who have on their own chosen to come here. Um, I, I can, you know, the most recent, obviously, one, John Tavares is the most obvious and recent one, but sure. Gary Roberts and Joe Neuendijk and, you know, guys who are 
Joe's a Hall of Famer and, and Gary's a borderline Hall of Famer. And, and you know, they, they loved, I mean, Gary Roberts loved playing here. He absolutely, he, he got off on the, he had played in, in, uh, in Carolina and he got off on coming here where every day mattered. Right. And, and so some guys love that and some guys don't. And I don't, I don't think, I think that's an old tired narrative that just, and, and it's funny because um, um, I'll use the Pat Quinn years as an example. Yeah. The Pat Quinn Maple Leafs were newspaper nuts. They knew everything that everybody wrote about everybody at all times. Today's world, athletes don't even look at newspapers. Right. They don't know who's yeah. written what unless it's made its way to social media. Sure. Um, they don't read the papers. They don't. Um, what I found, it's funny, what I found around the Blue Jays is when I see someone from the 92, 93 Blue Jays, they immediately call me by name. They immediately have a conversation about something to do with those teams. Um, and that's 30 years ago. If I walk down the street tomorrow and Bo Bichette and Vladdy Guerrero and, and Matt Chapman were walking beside me, they might nod hello thinking they've seen me. Right. But I think there's a pretty good chance they wouldn't know who I am or where I work. Interesting. But what, what are your thoughts on Kelly Gruber not getting invited to the uh, 92 reunion we had here? Something happened. Now, I wish I could remember what. Well, there was something a happened. Pitch Talks event with uh, Ashley Docking. Yeah. I know something happened that sort of put him in. He wasn't the only one. He was one. Inebri inebriated, yeah. as yeah. we say. There was, he wasn't the only one who wasn't. A misogynist in his yeah. uh, verbiage. Um, I don't know. I think in those kind of things, you invite everyone or you know, I don't like picking and choosing. But you say everyone, but you don't mean the guy they literally took off the wall of excellence, well, right? Like once you take him off the wall okay. of excellence, you can't invite him to the reunion. Here, here's, here's my problem even with that. Yeah. What did Robbie Alomar do? We have not been told. No one, like he has been convicted without a trial. Baseball has never said what it is they've banned him for. The Blue Jays say they did an investigation. I'm not sure I believe they did. Um, I think they were just told that he's now banned, and so they took his name off the wall. Right. Um, they kind of wrote him out of the script, if you want to call it that, when bringing the 92 team back, even though there is no 92 World Series without the home run in Oakland. Um, right. And so, and, and, and in fairness, you can, you can, you know, I don't know what, Ro I would love to hold him, accountable for what he did if i knew what he did um it would be like covering i've covered trials both as a sports writer and as the time i was a city columnist and um you know at the end of a trial the judge explains exactly why he ruled the way he ruled and so you have even though you may not agree with the ruling you have a sense of it you know i i tried actually to contact robbie and to contact his people and to find out you know do you have anything to say about any of this? And I have not been successful doing that. And, you know, unfortunately, he's, he's the best player the Blue Jays have ever had. Right. And now he's written out of the script for, you know, I'd love, again, it, could, it may be for reasons that are, you know, things that we don't want to necessarily know about. But as, as a journalist, my, my inclination is always to know. Right. Right. It is very unique that here we're just, they just trust us. This is so bad that you won't have a problem with us uh, deleting him from Blue Jays history. Do you, and think, do you think New York would do that? Do you think, do you think uh, if, if this was one of the, if this was Mariano Rivera or some beloved Yankee and, and they find out he's now banned from baseball, do you think the New York Times would just say, okay, we're not, we're not going to ask why. No, great question, Steve. I, I don't know. I don't know. I do know that, that yeah, that is interesting that we're just told uh, we don't know what he did. We just know it must have been pretty damn bad because uh, I mean, they, 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 they haven't banned, banned him. They haven't banned very many people right. from baseball. Right. Although you can remain banned today for gambling. Right. While, like we're, while we're taking in gambling revenue. <laughs> Hand over right. fist. Right. Right. Yes. Okay, Steve. Wow, I'm going to do a quick reset here and tell people your new book is called A Lucky Life, 
Gretzky, Crosby, Kawhi, and more from the best seat in the house. As you told us over the last 40 years, you've been documenting the greatest moments in Canada and around the world. We talked about Gretzky winning the cup, you know, Tiger Woods hitting the first drive of his career. Well, we didn't talk about it, but you were there. Hussein Bolt crossing the finish line. Uh, we Sidney Crosby, golden goal. Kawhi Leonard hitting the shot. Bounce, 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 bounce. Joe Carter, of course, which we don't, uh, we now call it a walk-off. At the time, we didn't have that verbiage, <laughs> but he he hit the home run, you know, Jose Batista flipping his bat, Michael Jordan retiring and coming out of retirement and playing that game in Indianapolis. Like so much to talk about with a lucky life, but I want to give you a few gifts real quick because you came here and you faced the music and I'm not even done yet because I mean, a lot of them, I, I'm not asking you because I got such feedback, but some more questions coming your way. But because you've been, you know, facing the music, as I said, I'm going to make sure you get a vegetarian lasagna courtesy of palma pasta you're taking that home with you sir that makes me very happy so yeah go stay hungry my friend okay uh i have some fresh craft beer from great lakes brewery they've been proud sponsors of the program for uh, for many many years now toronto mike i have a toronto mike sticker from sticker uh everybody who needs uh stickers or decals or temporary tattoos upload the image to sticker and you'll be happy with the uh, the results. Great quality, and they're great partners of this program. You have trouble sleeping. Have you? Uh, do you take any CBD or any uh, edibles for that? I was taking, and I'm diabetic, so I have to take sugar free edibles. And for a while, they were okay. And then what happens with me is, as I, as I get into anything, um, is I start, and then it stops working. And so I need to switch on to something else again. And that's probably okay. what's next for me. All right. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you're afflicted with that. That sounds horrific. Uh, it, the, it, uh, the thing about the thing that's happened, um, yeah, and I'd ahead. like to bore people with this, but, <laughs> but my doctor actually thinks I have the equivalent of sleep PTSD. Mm. Like it's not anymore about finding a way to get to sleep. It's finding a way to mentally clear the way to get to sleep. And a couple of, uh, I don't know, you tried a couple of tokes on a, on a, on a, on a, a spliff doesn't uh, do the trick for you. You've tried it all. Almost <laughs> everything you can try from booze to drugs to hypnotist, hypnot hypnosis to, right. oh yeah, lots well, of it. Shout out to Canna Cabana for those who are, uh, you know, taking a couple of puffs to help them fall asleep or even a, a gummy. I think it's a uh, Hebsey's dad. You mentioned him earlier, but Hebsey's dad takes half a, gummy cbd gummy and then at this time of day and then the other half and goes and he's able to sleep through the night and uh that's i like, am jealous of that <laughs> i'll bet you are i bet you are i actually have another great gift for you this is a wireless speaker courtesy of moneris that's a bluetooth speaker for you steve oh that's exciting and with that bluetooth speaker yeah you can listen to, i mean you kicked out the jams i know you love your bob dylan your bruce springsteen you can listen to all that but you can also listen to a couple of fantastic uh podcasts one is called the Advantaged Investor Podcast. It's from Raymond James. It features insights from leading professionals, a uh, valuable perspective for Canadian investors who want to remain knowledgeable, informed, and focused on long-term success. Chris Cooksey hooks it. Uh, Chris Cooksey hooks it. Chris Cooksey, whose son is a hell of a hockey player, Steve, put Cole Cooksey on your radar. That kid's going to be great. But Chris Cooksey hosts The Advantaged Investor, and I urge everybody to subscribe. You know what a sports guy I am? Tell me. I, I hear Raymond James. I think stadium. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure you do. I <laughs> I do now, too. But I always thought of uh, Reuben James, the great Kenny Rogers song. Yes. So, uh, shout out to Reuben James. But, of course, I mentioned that speaker's from Moneris, and they have a podcast called Yes, We Are Open. Al Grego, FOTM Al Grego, has been traveling the country telling the stories of small Canadian small businesses and their perseverance in the face of overwhelming adversity. So you can subscribe at we uh yes we are open podcast.com season three is underway i've been uh posting new episodes at torontomike.com and it was nominated for outstanding business series and outstanding branded series by the canadian podcast uh, awards so shout out to yes we are open i know steve i'm taking up a lot of your time but uh, these people were excited you were coming out for better or worse and mike m wanted me to ask you um I don't know about this one. There's two Mike M's. There's a Michael McMillan and a Mike M. Michael McMillan says, I hear you're a CFL diehard. What future do the Argos have? CFL diehard is probably the wrong term. I'm just someone who's been, I don't know, enjoying the league for as long as it's been around in its many incarnations. I think the Argos have 
the future that they have right now, which is they have a rabid small fan base and they do a very limited um, live crowd in the in the like, ten to twelve thousand right, range, I right. think. Um, now here's the interesting thing. You have mm-hmm. a soccer team in Toronto mm-hmm. that sells say thirty thousand a game and a football team that does ten to twelve thousand. Mm-hmm. And you have a soccer team that does almost no TV audience and a football team that does quite well numbers wise on TSN. And, and so it's, it's really, uh, and owned by, and they're owned by the same people. Is that a generational thing? Like, like the, the older crowd is more likely to have like a, I don't know, a PPM device telling us what they're watching. And they're more likely to watch on the television where the TFC attracts a younger crowd, which is more into like streaming and going to the bar and maybe less likely to carry a PPM device. I'm just, that, I'm just, that I have no idea of, here. I just find it fascinating that the two, it is interesting. Like, um, the CFL is forever sort of operating, you know, year to year and yeah. week to week and franchise right. to franchise. Right. Um, they do. It's it's a terrific television product, and it's funny. It's it's been a pretty good TV product in the U.S. this year. Oh, and they their their rights are up, and they're gonna hit some reasonable money for the amount of people that are actually watching. Wow, people like football. Like, sure. there's no question. I mean. Do, do they like CFL football necessarily? Not always. This hasn't been the greatest CFL season. Um, there's you know, There were nine players um, nominated for player of the year in the CFL, and only three were quarterbacks, which tells you that this has been a challenging season because quarterbacks normally are the guy who gets you know nominated from every team. Right. Um, the Argos are victims of themselves. They don't promote very well. They don't let people know what's going on. They're not covered. The media doesn't do a good job covering them other than our paper. Um, I don't believe they actually beat people. I don't think the Star has beat person. I don't think the Globe has a beat person. Well, that's interesting. Um, you know, it's it's funny how what's happened. I mean, I grew up in a Toronto where there, there was only two teams. Right. You know, you had the Argos in the summer and, and the Leafs in the winter. And, and you liked one as much as the other. And they seemed to be the same. There was no... Status difference actually to say at the time the CF the CFL was a bigger league than the NFL. CFL had nine teams. The NFL uh, the NHL had six, and so you know times have gone to where hockey has dwarfed everything in this town, and then baseball came in and it dwarfed the CFL, and the CFL stays as it is. I, I call it existential football. Sometimes you know they exist, um, and you hope that next year will be better than this year. Uh, it's a challenge in, the, in this market more than any others. And here we are 40 minutes away from a place where it's not really a challenge. And it's kind of remarkable to me that, that you see that difference. And I thought, and I, I, I will admit to being completely wrong on this, mm-hmm. when they moved to BMO, I thought this is going to revitalize football interest the way it happened in, in Montreal right. when the Alouettes came back. And I thought, you know, people are going to, it's such a good stadium that people are going to get in there and they're going to find out how much fun it is to go to a football game. So I sent out, I cleared off my email list of old friends. And I said, this is what I'm doing. I'm, got, I'm buying season tickets and I want you to buy them with me. And we're going to get great seats and we're going to have a group together and we're all going to sit together and it's going to be a barrel of fun <laughs> taking us back to our youth because we all grew up as Argo fans. Right. And um, started, I had 39 tickets the first year. It was a pretty good number. Yeah. And here we are. Is it year four, maybe? Year five? I don't know what year it is. Um, Around that. Yeah. yeah. I think five. Uh, we're down to eight. Wow. Um, most of the people have left for a variety is of Is that because they can't be bothered getting their butts into the city? Like, even I though it's exhibition, so. there's yeah, a nice depends, go station there. Depends where you live, I guess. Yeah. Some of it was that. There were so many different circumstances. Some of it, the, people, the, did, games, the people didn't like it. The people didn't care. Right. Like, there was all kinds of different reasons. And <sighs> it's... It, I'm I'm sitting there. I'm there with Dave Naylor, who um, you know covers. Is, is the, Schultz in your group? Yep, Schultz. Okay, because there was a ticket yeah. available for this last yeah. game. I was on a thread for that. Yeah. Okay, Dave David Schultz, who's now a reti- former roommate of mine, yeah. now retired um, sports writer from the Globe and Mail. He's in our group. Dave Naylor covers TSN fo- okay. football for them. Uh, Paul Woods, who wrote the book on Rocket Ismail, and former Toronto Star editor, uh, is in the group. Um, Bill Pierce, who's sports editor of the Toronto Sun, 
was in the group. I don't think he renewed this year. Mm. She couldn't tell because he didn't come to any games last year. So I wasn't <laughs> sure whether his seats are empty or whether he he um, just doesn't use them. But we have a few left still, but not many from from the beginning. And you know, I thought again, what's what's interesting is we're in the, we're in the side, the one side that that's kind of full, and so there is atmosphere in that in that section, right? But it's basically the only section. Or the only part of the stadium. side, you know, I root for him. I I don't like to see this, but uh, yeah, I guess it is what it is. But I I don't I don't know why that's a great venue. I mean, well, I, I, had, I had a note Sunday. Yeah, the Argos finished first in the East. Right, second year in a row, new coach, two years as the coach, two years as a starting quarterback for McLeod Bethel Thompson, um, and first play. And you think this is great, mm-hmm. and yet all you hear in, in sitting around my seats and, and wherever else, people yelling at the quarterback, people <laughs> yelling at the coach. It's like, you know, it's like in in, in the rest of the city, you know, f- for the other teams to be finishing first, you'd be thinking this is great. Look yeah. at the Raptors first in the in the East or. Or or somebody, but the Argo was there first, and people just kind of nod and go on to. The I rest. think it's the nature of whatever. Was there four teams in that division? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, if I ask you this question right yeah, now, go ahead. How many Argos players could you name on the current roster? Yes, uh, that quarterback that you mentioned. That's it. I don't know any members of this current Argo team. Okay, how many Raptors can you name? Yeah, I could name a bunch of Raptors. Yeah, teams. and same with the Blue Jays, <laughs> and same with the Leafs. Oh, I could yeah, give you the whole lineup. Sure. You know, you probably throw Obey Kubel at me if I asked you about the Leafs. <laughs> You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I mean, you, you said it. You guys cover it, and the TSN obviously covers it. They got the broadcasting rights. On that note about the broadcasting rights, so this is a good question. Uh, if I could dig it up here, let's see. Uh, stand by here. Uh, bunch I'm killing here. Does he think there's still room? This is from Super Fun Happy Slide. That's a great handle. Super Fun Happy Slide. Does he does he think there's still room in Canadian sports media to be critical of the local home team, considering rights properties? Well, for the television networks, that's more and more difficult. But if you watch, I'll, I'll use TSN as an example. Yeah. Because TSN and Sportsnet split the rights for Maple Leaf for the Maple Leaf uh, regional games. Right. If you watched last like night's last night was TSN, TSN, right? They're very harsh in their in their coverage of the Leafs, and they're very Open and they're very, um, you know. I think I think TSN has always done a terrific job in how they broadcast hockey, but um, but yeah. they're very um, they're not the least bit sort of protective of the Leafs, which is good. And Mark Masters, who covers the team as their reporter, is one of those guys who will ask tough questions and will ask hard questions. And so, you know, I I don't I don't think that's necessarily the case. Where we see that way more. And it might be because they have so many people covering the team that it's hard to imagine is is watching how Sportsnet handles the Blue Jays. It's a bit kids. It's a bit kids gloves, and it's a bit uh, Homer ish from the inside, and not very many people speak their mind very often. In fact, Buck Martinez said something I, I can't remember what exactly it was two thirds of the way through the season that was only marginally critical of what they were doing. And it was like trending on Twitter <laughs> yes, for two days. Yes, it was. You know, so so yeah, there's there's a fine line as as a rights holder. But here's the thing. TSN is Bell. Uh Sportsnet is Rogers. Who are the majority owners of the Toronto Maple Leafs? Right. Uh, they have thirty seven point five percent each, yeah, I think. They have seventy five percent. Yeah. Uh, Bell and Rogers. Right. So, you know, if they're asking their people to quiet down um, there's not much um, notice of that. Right, right. Uh, do you got a good John Cordick uh, story for Elephants and Stars? Every time I have someone on who covered that era of the Leafs, uh, he's looking for a John Cordick memory. Most of my John Cordick stories I can't tell. <laughs> um, this one I think I can, and I hope... It's not even that good of a story, but I always it always amused me. Yeah. Um, John Cordick was sitting, and I don't remember beside whom, in the dressing room, and... The, and they're having a serious conversation. And the serious conversation is, if you could only pick one, which one do you want? Wilma or Betty? <laughs> and that's, every time I think of John Cordick, that's one of the, you know, I think of him and I think of him trying to cash checks because he always had difficulty cashing checks. Aww. But, but you know, having that, and they're having a serious conversation about the- <laughs> Wilma of, or Betty? Wilma or Betty. Yeah. I know we used to do that. Usually with, it was yeah, with the, it was Betty with the, and uh, with Veronica. The, with the Betty and Veronica. 
Yeah, or the uh, the you know the ones from from WKRP or or yeah the or, or uh, yeah Gilligan's ginger, Island yeah ginger yeah. or Marianne yeah, yeah, that would be the big one right 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 <laughs> Martina and Chrissy you know there was right. like, there was lots of that stuff but right. but you didn't hear Wilma and Betty very often no no you didn't because they're tough to differentiate uh, character wise Michael Coffey I would like uh, I would ask him what's his biggest Olympic moment that uh, he covered and why was it Ben Johnson's nine seven nine in Seoul. That's Michael Coffey speaking. What say you? Um, I wasn't in Seoul. It's the it's the only Summer Olympics I've missed in uh, since the most recent ones, which I didn't go to. Uh, I've been to seventeen Olympics. Yeah. The best moment as a Canadian was Bailey's win in the hundred. Mm. Um, and 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 when you combine the two Saturday nights, yeah. it was Bailey's win in the hundred, and then the four by one win where they pounded the Americans who'd never lost before. Amazing. Those two things juxtaposed. It was like, you know, the 96 Olympics was was a gong show. Honestly, it was a piece of junk. The Atlanta people, you know, were clueless and didn't know how to put on the games and messed up in, in a million different ways. And I think everybody who went was miserable. But But my greatest Olympic moment, as a Canadian, my greatest Olympic moments are those two runs as a world, looking at the entire world, the first time I watched uh, Usain Bolt wow. win the hundred, when he was, um, he was so far ahead that he looked back, almost stopped, <laughs> and still shattered the world record. Yeah. And I always wondered if he had gone right through, what would that record be? And. I don't know if you remember the picture, but there's one of the triple crown races where Secretariat is mm. in the picture and there's no other horse in the in the photo. Yes. And you could see your TV screen and there's Secretariat so far ahead. Yeah. And that's what I thought of watching Bolt. Like, like look at how fast he was. And he, he took your breath away like no athlete. I've, again, I'm a hundred meters nut. Yeah. So add that to it. But he took he took my breath away. I saw I I I covered all nine of his gold medals. Yeah, uh, one got I, taken away. But yeah, I, yeah. But I, I made sure that. I, but they, yeah, on that day he had won. Sure, of course. And, yeah, and he had which no, is unbelievable. And he had nothing to do, by the way, with with no the, no. It was uh, someone else on the four by one hundred yeah. meters. So, but I I, I made it a point. Johan that, Blake, maybe. Sometimes at an Olympics, you can't always choose where you are or where you're going or what's going on that day. Right. You have to go with what the assignment is. But I, I kind of made it a point to make sure I was at all of, through three different Olympics, I was at all nine of his gold medal amazing. races. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. We'll never see another. That's amazing. Blue Jays twit. Ask him how often he goes to Center Street Deli. I always see him there. Um, I used to go more often when they were open for <laughs> dinner. But post-pandemic, they can't get staff like everybody else. And so they're not open for dinner anymore. Um, probably once every two weeks. Um, would be the would be the count. Um, I can go. I can go there and have matzo ball soup every day of the week and be happy for the rest of my life. Scott M writes: Why has sports journalism gotten so soft when asking tough questions? There's not many left that will. So we've already established you'll ask the tough questions. And you said you know Mark Masters well, but we're, we, there's only you probably can run them down, and maybe I don't know if you do it on the mic, but privately you'd probably run down the names of the journalists in this market that'll still ask a tough question. Well, one of my favorites, Dave Perkins is now retired. Um, Dave Perkins had a incredible sense of humor and an incredible way to ask the question that everyone else was thinking and didn't really want to ask. And do you remember the match race that Donovan Bailey had with Michael Johnson? How could I forget? Okay. It was, the whole event was a bit of a disaster when it came down to the end. But, but nonetheless, Michael Johnson comes into the press conference. And first question, Dave Perkins, Toronto star, and Perky puts up his hand and says, Michael, at what point did you decide to pull the shoot? <laughs> oh. It was like everyone saw he came up lame, right? And yeah. Suppo sure. Supposed hamstring. And, right. You know. Uh, and and it just set a tone for that press conference of like tension that was terrific because athletes aren't used to being asked those kind of direct questions and 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 that's that was one of my favorite Dave Perkins moments. AG wants me to ask you if you miss coaching kids hockey. Uh, I referred or lines uh, 
Okay. He refers, to, and I'm not sure if I re- understand this next part, but uh, he just says that he, uh, oh, I see. He refereed many of your games back in the day, and he, he said he never had any serious disagreements with you. So, AG. Jeez, he caught me on good days then. <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever done anything in my life that I enjoyed more than coaching kids hockey. Wow. It, it was, and I did 26 seasons of it. I, I've done over 1,000 games of minor hockey in Toronto. And I got to be honest with you, I some of my best friends today are guys I coached with or parents on the teams that I coached. Um, some of my kids' best friends, especially my older son, um, are people that he played hockey with. My Minor hockey changed our lives. I right. mean, it really impactfully changed my life. And I loved being around the kids. I love the sport. I love the teaching aspect. I love, one of my favorite things to do when was to sit and tie my skates and listen to the conversations to the kids. Like when you listen to a, a group of 12 or 13 year olds in a room, there's, it's stream of consciousness conversation that goes in a hundred directions at once. And honestly, if I had put a tape recorder on, I probably could have written a pretty good <laughs> script for a play or a movie. Right. Um, just based on the years of, of doing it. I, I miss it. I wish I was still doing it. Um, unfortunately, for many circumstances, reasons I can't. Um, but boy, it it is something that I am so happy that I was part of. And and to, you know, it's neat to this when you go, you're walking in a mall on a Saturday, mm-hmm. and then some kid you don't even know who he is comes up and gives you a hug. And you know, when you have a kid and he's ten, and now he's twenty five, you don't always wow. know what he looks like, right? No, nope. they've changed. You know, he's got a beard now, <laughs> right. or, or something. Um, but but they treat you with such regard and such happiness, and and I just have you know, I have such fond memories of all of those years, and I I think the whole family does. And when I listen even to my kids now, my kids weren't good enough to play at any high level. They were good. They were good hockey players for the levels that they played at. Um, um, but when I hear them talking about we went to this tournament in Detroit or this tournament in Pittsburgh or this this thing in Niagara Falls, or they talk about it like it was yesterday, wow. and and with for, so fondly with great memories, and I, and I have so many of those too. Uh, and you know what? It's again, if I could, you know, the one thing if I could do it again and do it now, at my age and, and in my certain health situations, then I I would be back doing it. Gordster would, uh, wants me to ask you, what did you think of Brian Burke, especially his time as Leafs GM in 08? Well, it's a funny story. Um, Brian Burke was in Anaheim, and I had been approached by someone involved with the Maple Leafs, whose name I can't say. Um, and they said, can you find out if the following people have any interest in being GM of the Leafs? And Burke was one of the people on the list that I was going to call and do some help helping somebody find out whether there was any interest. And so I see Brian Burke at the Stanley Cup final. Anaheim is in the final. And I said to him, do you have any interest in, in, in working for the Leafs? And here's approximately the money and approximately the kind of years you'd get. Um, and his eyes lit up. And... Um, and to the point where, you know, when it came, I think it was this, a year or so later when it actually came to be. Right. Um, he accepted the Leafs job on the American Thanksgiving. He was having dinner with his family in Boston. He called me at home to tell me that he accepted. So our relationship was such that, um, that you know, he would think enough of me to phone me and inform me that, yeah, I've taken this job. Um, I thought, and I advocated for him to get the job. I thought he would be perfect for it. Right. I thought he had made enough great trades and he understood what it took to win. And he, he you know, he had taken that Anaheim defense and, and completely rebuilt it in like a year and a half. And, right. um, and I thought, again, he'd be perfect for the job. As he got into the Toronto job, I thought he became way too much about Brian and not nearly enough about the job he had to do. And as time went on, you know, our relationship lost its way. And 
has never been repaired and I don't, I don't think will ever be repaired. Um, and, but that, but my relationship with him has nothing to do with why he got fired or what happened with him getting fired. And, um, uh, and he was fired. I thought at the right time for probably the right reasons. And, and so I think ultimately it was a disappointment because he did it make the team better and he didn't bring them to the place he wanted to bring them to and he never had a playoff run of any kind and so yeah brian burke's sort of a footnote in maple leafs history yeah. really mike m uh, ask simmons if his intent in his writing is to make himself the story by getting himself intertwined w- into weird spats with various athletes i don't <laughs> think any journalist ever wants to be the story um i just you know Anytime I have been, it's never been a comfortable position. Uh, I'll, I'll use the Austin Matthews COVID story as a, I was the first person or the only person at the time to report that he had got COVID. This is just when COVID's beginning. Right. And so it became such a cause celeb at the time. I think Rudy Gobert and Zeke Elliott and a few others, um, you know, had, had, had been contacted with COVID, but he was the first NHL guy and certainly the first Toronto prominent athlete. Sure. And everybody turned on me like I had violated his privacy. Well, right. Within the next year or so, every single athlete was being named by the leagues. Here are our players this week. They are the following. So this became the greatest non-story of all time, but not to the people who believe, I've, including Matthews, who, who at the time. I, we've never had a conversation about it because we've never had the opportunity to, since since the pandemic started, to have the kind of conversation you would need to talk about it. But it became a huge, TSN wouldn't report it. Sportsnet wouldn't report it. Yeah. Like it was like I people remember. were, people were treating it like it was like, and, and the worst thing was is that TSN knew and they still wouldn't report it. They just, they, they, they philosophically disagreed with it. Of course they reported Rudy Gobert and, and Zeke Elliott. Yeah, but those. they were announced by the, the team or the league. Like, um, so that was, I guess that's the difference from uh, TSN's yeah. perspective, right? Yeah, well, I know. you know, to me, to me, you have it or you don't have it. You know, you're pregnant or you're not. <laughs> um, but, you know, that became such, you know, it turned so many people against me. And you're thinking, well, did I write that to be noticed? No, I wrote it because it was a story. And because it was a legitimate story and because it should have been written. And I stand by that. We'll always stand by that. So on that note, Greg, and this is the last, so two last questions here. And then I want to give you my top 10 uh, Steve Simmons uh, articles that appear in A Lucky Life, Gretzky, Crosby, Kawhi, and more from the best seat in the house, which you can get now and would be a great uh, holiday gift for somebody who loves sports in your life. But uh, Greg Gold says, does it bother him? So real talk here, Steve, does it bother you? And this is Greg's words, but he writes that he is the most disliked sports writer in the Toronto media scene. Well, it depends how you find dis, dis find disliked. If if Cahal Kelly has a has a great quote, Cahal Kelly, the very very good columnist with the Globe and Mail, who won't do Twitter, won't do Twitter. I don't know if has he has he been here. Uh, you know what? He told me. I'm trying to remember. We talked via email because he listens to Toronto Mike, and he said something to the effect of. Yeah, he wasn't going to do it. He was going to stay private. Yeah, somehow, I, I, I can see that. I mean, it's funny. I'm going to stay private, but I'm going to write a memoir. <laughs> okay. Um, and I love Cahal. Because you have editorial. See, yeah. with you, you didn't tell me what I could ask you. I mean, look at the questions I've asked you today, right? He probably I, I doesn't love, want to face that. I love Cahal. I think he's immensely talented, and I wish I could use the written word in the matter in which he does. But he wrote in the back of my book, mm-hmm. the highest calling of a sports columnist is not to be right, but to be read. Steve Simmons is right most of the time, must be read all of the time. There's no further, there's no higher uh, professional compliment I can think of. Um, I think that's, you know, it's an amazing comment from an amazing columnist. And I go back to my friend Terry Jones, who's longtime Uh sports writer for the Edmonton Sun. And and his, he said to me years ago, your job is to get the reader from the first paragraph to the last one. How you choose to accomplish that, that's that's your business. And so, you know, I forget the, what the wording of the question is, but, you know, I'm, I'm hated, but I'm read. Right. So it's a... You're noticed. Well, I don't know if... Like maybe you know, indifference is yeah. the enemy of... Yeah. Uh, indifference is definitely the enemy of anyone writing sure. a column. If, if, and if boring. The, I always if, say... If you're indifferent, then yeah. if you're indifferent, you're not doing your job. Right. 
to me, the the great enemy is boredom. Like, just be interesting, you, you know. And and you and you know, you can be great. At, I mean, I'll use my friend Bob Elliott. You can be great as your at your job and never be in any controversy, because right. that's just how he chose to conduct sure. himself. And sure. and you know what? And and Bob Bob and I used to say because we would sit beside each other. And a lot of times when you're working with someone at a game, mm -hmm. about the seventh inning, you look at each other and say, okay, this is what I'm writing. What are you writing? Well, Bob and I discovered very early on that we never had to do that because we could be writing exactly the same thing and it would <laughs> right. never be the same. Right, right. Um, Last question for you and then uh, a little more in the book and then you've been amazing. Uh, in fact, the vegetarian lasagna was special order for you. So the Petrucci family at uh, Palma Pasta, uh, big fans of yours and wanted to make sure you had a vegetarian lasagna. So Christopher Snow just writes, Steve, I've been reading your article since I was a kid, reading the paper with my dad. Don't change, sir. So he just don't ever change for Christopher Snow. I think um, everybody should send Christopher Snow flowers today and, <laughs> and say thank you very much. And, you know, you read the, the Cajal uh, quote in the back of your book. Another one I'm going to read is from Brendan Shanahan, you know, president of our Toronto Maple Leafs. And uh, he went to the same high school I went to. So shout out to Mimico's Brendan Shanahan. Steve Simmons doesn't ever sit on the fence when it comes to his writing. He takes a position and tells it like he sees it. I will buy his book. And I am quite certain I will throw it in the fire and burn it, but only after I've read it. So there's a great quote. Yeah, that, one, that one made me laugh. <laughs> That's a great one. And very quickly here, my friend, I've taken a lot of your time, but uh, I was, you know, I'm going through your great stories, a great collection. So, you know, you got a great story on Donovan Bailey in Atlanta. Uh, we're both big Donovan guys. We talked quite a bit about Donovan Bailey today. We even heard from Donovan Bailey. He's going to be here sitting in that very same seat. Well, actually, he sits in that seat and Jason Porwando sits in your seat there. But tomorrow he'll be here and we spend a lot of time together. I quite like the guy. And uh, so I have my top 10 list. I've got Donovan Bailey in Atlanta from 1996. The home run that changed everything. This is an article from October 17, 1992 about Roberto Alomar's home run against the Oakland Athletics. And we did talk earlier about the fact that he has been all but erased from Blue Jays history. Completely gone. Although, when you do a montage of everything in 92, you do still get, I think, I saw it, uh, he, you know, Alomar throwing his arms yeah. in the air after the his, home run. His arms were thrown in the air, but they didn't mention him. No, they yeah. did not. Yeah. Absolutely did not mention him. Uh, the Kid Named Yager. This is from uh, May 19th, 1992. I just want to shout out my recent conversation with Brian Trottier. It's uh, from last week. Uh, Brian was on those two, uh, the two Stanley Cup uh, winning teams that uh, when Yager was a rookie uh, on those Penguins teams, and we had a great chat about Yarmy Yager. I want to jump in just for yeah, one and, second. Yeah, you can always jump in. Um, one of the things I loved about that story, he was a rookie, and he wasn't old enough to drink. Um, as you had to be twenty one in the United States to drink, and I think he was eighteen, and so he would go to the bar with the players. And then they would stick him like in the room where the, the arcade was and right. he would go and play video games. <laughs> well, um, one of the things that I made at that time, a local radio station, mm -hmm. um, FM, FM radio station decided they were going to have a bit every morning called Yarmer Weather. And so, you know, the morning, you know, today's, today's temperature, so and so. Now let's go to Yarmer Weather. <laughs> and it was Yarmer's today, because he could barely speak English, right? Right. Today, cold. <laughs> or today hot and and they taped him doing you know today rain like every kind of sort of weather report he could have done and uh, and they played yarmer weather every single morning on this <laughs> fm radio station that's great uh number four on my list the uh, sickness cured kessel gone that's from july 2nd 2015 that's the uh, one with the opening reference which you you already in great detail explained yourself but uh i did notice i guess it's been edited to leave the specifics of where the hot dog hot dog stand is well it? one thing about the book it was edited for obviously reason you know you need to edit everything sure. but also for factual circumstances and if the streets were wrong and they right. were then we put in downtown rather than put in specific seats i maintain to this day yeah if you want to know why phil kessel was traded read that piece forget about forget the hot dogs in the first two paragraphs if you if, if you want to be consumed with that uh, read that piece because it tells you exactly why brendan shanahan and and company didn't want him a quick mike babcock story yeah to that mike babcock gets hired by the leafs just before the draft where they get Matthews and um, I think it was Matthews um, and uh, no, it was Marner. Sorry. But it was just before they trade Kessel. And 
So I'm having a conversation with Mike and we're trying to establish ground rules as you do with any coach or GM, you know, how do you want to work? Do you want to, yeah. you know, text each other? Do you want to email? Do you want phone calls? What, what is it? And he says, I don't go off the record. I said, what do you mean? I, I, I won't go off. A lot of coaches will go off the record with you. Sure. So that's great. So about a minute later, I said, well, what, do you want Phil Kessel on your team? And he, and he paused and said, can we go off the record for a moment? <laughs> All right, now that statute of limitations have expired, what did he say off the record? He you? didn't. We never, we never went there. Because no. I think I said, we don't, we don't go off the record. <laughs> right, right. There is no off the record. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. I, but I, I just thought... But that he's was, a great... Yeah, that's great. It's, yeah. Uh, Phil Kessel I, uh, has leaned into the whole hot dog thing. Like now it's like... that's a, like a oh, And you know what he's never done? He's never denied it. Have you ever heard him say No. Uh, no, I don't think I have. No, um, no, that, no. That's one of the things that amused, has amused me over the years is that he gets... I, I love, by the way, you, you know, the, he's now playing in Vegas. Yeah. Do you know what his nickname is? With what? The Vegas Golden Knights? Hot dog? No, Selkie. Because <laughs> he has the worst plus minus, <laughs> you know, of any player of his generation. Wow. Still st hasn't missed a game since no. you wrote that article, though. No. Uh, touch them all, Joe. That's the, uh, I just want to, that was from October 24th, 1993. That gives me a chance to tell people there's a great Joe Carter micumentary in the Toronto Mike feed that people should uh, check out. Um, one thing about the Donovan Bailey piece you referenced yeah. and about the Joe Carter piece and probably some other ones. Yeah. They were written on deadline at night against the clock. Like no time to think, no time. Like right. you probably wrote those pieces in less than half an hour. Um, and a huge, huge events. And, and it's amazing that any of it stands up years later. Because <laughs> sometimes you look back at your stuff and you say, oh my God, did I really write that? Joey Bats, the most hated man in baseball. That's from October 19, 2015. I'm, uh, ignore the knocking on my door. We're, we're almost done here, but maybe that's a, uh, a delivery of uh, Palma Pasta for you. But the Joey Bats, and then uh, burn through this because uh, uh, hope arrives in Vince Carter. This is from 9th, June 28th, 1998. I just had uh, Chuck Swirsky on the program, and we were talking quite a bit about Air Canada, Vince Carter, and what he meant to this franchise. The Rocket at Argos Camp, that's from June 1991, Rocket Ishmael. Uh, the Greatest of All Time, June 5th, 2016. And, of course, we conclude things with The Golden Goal, written March 1st, 2010, of course, at Sidney Crosby's. Any final thoughts, my friend? You've been yeah, amazing. I wanted to touch on, on some of the stories in the book that are stories you wouldn't necessarily point to as historical or, or, or memorable for Canadians. And one of my favorite pieces in there is about a guy named Bernie Custis. And I don't know if that name means anything to most people. It doesn't mean anything to me, I don't think. Bernie Custis is the first African-American to play quarterback at an NCAA school. He went to Syracuse University. He had a roommate at Syracuse University that you might know the name of, Al Davis. Right, of course. And Just win, baby. Al Davis goes on to only Oakland Raiders. Bernie gets drafted or picked, signed by the Cleveland Browns to go there and play. Only he's a quarterback at a time when there are no black quarterbacks in the NFL, and the NFL was not ready for black quarterbacks. And so Bernie, they want Bernie to switch positions. And Bernie won't switch positions. They said, well, you're a good enough athlete. You can play DB. You can play receiver. You can play wherever you want to play. We're going to find a place for you. And, and he said, no, I'm a quarterback. And so the, the Cleveland Browns didn't want to waive him because they thought someone else was going to pick him up on waivers. And, and they didn't know what he would turn into. Right. So in those days, at times being as different as they are now, you could sell a player from an NFL team to a CFL team. So they sold the contract of Bernie Custis to the Hamilton Ticats. Mm. And geographically, Hamilton is the closest city to Cleveland, closest CFL city to Cleveland. So it wasn't far for him to go. And was, right. So he goes to Hamilton, and he becomes the starting quarterback of the Tiger Cats, thus becoming the first wow. black starting quarterback in the CFL at a time... Later, you know, later you have Warren Moon and Conrad Holloway and, and so many guys who, you know, this was a, a great place for the black quarterback to establish himself. And so Bernie was, he made, he made history at Syracuse. Then he makes history in Hamilton, becomes a teacher in Hamilton, and I think a principal as well, and has a school named after him now. He's since passed away. 
Um, but oh, his roommate, Al Davis, moves on to become the owner of the Oakland Raiders. And what does he want to do? He wants to hire Bernie for a variety of different jobs over the years. He keeps offering him jobs. Uh, and Bernie says, you know what? I'm happy. I'm playing quarterback here. I'm teaching school. I'm, everything's going great. My life is fantastic. And he never went to the Oakland Raiders. And he, you know, he, 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 you would see Bernie in the press box at a lot of Ticat games and a lot of Argo games. And just to, list, to sit down and listen to him, it was, wow. it was to me like, you know, it's like talking, I don't know if you know, do you know Wayne Embry at all? Uh, I know of him, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. Wayne we Embry, talked about him. He might, too. he may be the most fascinating man I have ever spoken to. Wow. Uh, in, in, in professional sports. Like he, he's, he's like a history of the last century. Wow. All the things he lived through. And, you know, he tells an amazing story about, he was roommates with Oscar Robertson. Wow. You know, the great NBA. Triple double, sure. Yeah, uh, the great NBA player, Oscar Robertson. And he, he gets a phone call from his wife. We're going to Selma to march. Selma, Alabama. Of course. And he, here they are on the road for the Cincinnati, I think they were the Royals basketball team. They're on the road with Cincinnati. And Oscar, and they hang up the phone. And those days, there's no cell phones. Right. Oscar Robertson's wife phones a minute later to tell her husband that I'm marching to Selma. And the two wives went on one of the most historic marches wow. in, in history, much to the protestations of their basketball playing husbands who <laughs> were worried something terrible was going to happen. And, you know, that's just one of the incredible... Wayne was the first African-American um, general manager in the NBA. He, you know, was a, um, a Hall of Fame player, and he's in the Hall of Fame as a, as a manager. Like, he, he also traded Kareem Jabbar from Milwaukee to the Lakers. Wow. Uh, like, the, like, there's so many things about him that, that fascinate me. And again, to me, he, he, he's an encyclopedia unto himself. Steve, you've had a lucky life. I, some days I would agree with you. <laughs> and where would you like people to pick? Do you have any preference where they get a copy of A Lucky Life, Gretzky, Crosby, Kawhi, and more from the best seat in the house? We'll be in Canadian bookstores in early November. Oh, so it's actually not out yet. Oh, I got no, an advanced it's, copy. It's, oh. it's, it's available online right okay, now. Online. You can get it at Chapters Indigo. You can get it from, I presume, from Costco and from those kind of stores. And from, gotcha. um, you know, Amazon. Uh, so it is available online. And uh, and what I, I hate to p pump my own stuff. Go. But if you have a uh, cousin, an uncle, somebody you need to get a stocking stuffer for or something, if they're sports fans and they're Canadian sports fans, this is the kind of book that you can s stick in the washroom and you pick up a different chapter each, each time. You don't have to read it in order. And, and just find your way through it. I think I think people will really, really enjoy it. And that brings us to the end of our 1,142nd show. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Toronto Mike. Steve, you're at Steve Simmons on Twitter? Uh, Simmons Steve. So, yeah, that's right. It's inverted. Follow Simmons Steve on Twitter. Our friends at Great Lakes Brewery are at Great Lakes Beer. Palma Pasta is at Palma Pasta. Sticker U is at Sticker U. Moneris is at Moneris. Raymond James Canada are at Raymond James CDN. Recycle My Electronics are at EPRA underscore Canada. Ridley Funeral Home are at Ridley FH. And Canna Cabana are at Canna Cabana underscore. See you all Wednesday when my special guest is Tony Napo.
sabotages the best that I can Good. But I 